virtual conferences. So of course, all the meetings are virtual today. And, um, and the question in front of us is, how do we organize the virtual conferences so that everybody gets to enjoy it and gets a lot out of it? And um, today we will, we will discuss a whole bunch of uh, recent virtual conferences and see how much we can learn and have some discussion. And um, some of those conferences are, are medium-sized. So we will uh, also touch on some of the, the, the larger conferences. And um, we know that uh, we know that there's, there's just so much experience, but there's also so many upcoming virtual conferences. So we are, we are sort of at an, an, an inflection point where we can, we can both learn from, uh, from those who came before us and, uh, and try to make decisions about the upcoming conferences. So what we'll do is that we will begin with uh, the recent, um, uh, well, so it's, I guess it's a recent, has the task force concluded? We had an ACM form, the virtu a task force on virtual conferences. Uh, they did their work in the spring. Um, maybe it's technically still a task force, but they uh, uh, came up with their report already in April. And we have the leaders from the task force here and um, they, will, they will present. Uh, so we have uh, we have Benjamin Pierce, we have uh, Kolo, we Jennifer Matthews, and we'll um, then we move on to experience reports from uh, recent virtual conferences. Uh, we have a whole bunch of them. We have uh, people who organize seven of the virtual conferences that have been happening just recently, and uh, we will have discussion and learn as much from them as we can. And then there's a whole other dimension, which is the emerging tool support for virtual conferences. And um, uh, I, we invited uh, the, let's call it the developers of uh, three of those tools to speak. And um, maybe some of those tools will be useful to you uh, in conferences coming up. And, uh, and really part of the reason for presenting these tools is to get inspired, both, uh, both to find out if there are other tools that you know about, or maybe improvements that you would like to see, or uh, maybe tools that we should develop in the future. And um, the situation is there's going to be close to 100 conferences that will be virtual in ACM until Christmas. And every time a month ticks by, I'm beginning to think that we are looking into 2021, perhaps, and, and uh, maybe there'll be many more uh, virtual conferences. And so uh, um, we, should, we should be thinking about it, and we are thinking about it. And uh, so today, let's have, have, have a lot of discussion. We organized uh, the program so that uh, about half the time is speaking time by presenters and half the time is discussion time for all of us. And, um, you know, do the usual, uh, pre press the raise hand button uh, somewhere uh, on your screen under participants uh, or uh, plainly write something in the chat. I will be uh, spending the meeting uh, reading the chat window and um, whenever there's uh, something that, uh, that ought to be brought up as a question there, I will if nobody else brings it up, I will, so that we can uh, cover all the questions, no matter how you want to ask them. And um, of course, we have people with experience beyond those seven presentations we will have on the call, so every, everybody can contribute. Um, we, uh, we, have a, uh, we have a lot of people on the call. We have uh, even more uh, joining as we go. Some people are in weird time zone. So in particular, I noticed that uh, we have Sok Young from Korea on the call. There are other people uh, in Europe. And um, so uh, many thanks to all of you who are, uh, are joining uh, sometimes under um, just sort of like have to give up on dinner, or have to give up on sleep or whatever it is. And, um, and then finally, special welcome to Ricky Hanson, our former president and current CEO of ACM. Thanks for joining. And um, other than that, uh, let me just mention one thing that we heard last Friday when we, uh, we had the first meeting uh, of this kind where we were focusing more on the, on the six with a single conference. Joan Feigenbaum, who is our uh, vice president of ACM, announced that there will be a standing committee in ACM on virtual conferences. Uh, and... Um, so my guess is that there's going to be some kind of transition from the task force on virtual conferences that did a lot of good in the last few months, and then to a standing committee that will have a more permanent role in ACM. The, the details are forthcoming on what the charter of the 
uh, of the standing committee will be, but we can take it as a clear sign that the leaders of ACM are very serious about virtual conferences and, and what we are going to do with them. Very good. So um, now we are moving on to the first uh, part of the program. And um, so this is where we will have the leaders of the presidential task force speak. And um, so we have um, both the two, uh, two co-chairs, uh, Krista Lopes and Jenna Matthews. Uh, uh, so let me just briefly say that uh, Jenna Matthews is my uh, predecessor two rounds ago as chair of the, of the SGB executive committee. She is uh, so, uh, currently on the ACM council and of course a former member of the ACM executive committee. Krista Lopes is uh, 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 first of all, uh, co-chair of the task force. She is a former member of the executive committee of SIGPLAN and uh, played a, a major role in the uh, formation of the uh, ACM PACM uh, that uh, started just a couple of years ago. And finally, Benjamin Pierce, who is also on the ACM council and who was the executive editor of the task force report and uh, has done a lot to spearhead the push for what ACM can do about climate change. Um, and they will speak, so over to you. So I think I'm gonna start out, yes, Benjamin and, and Krista? That's right. Okay, so I will start by saying, while we're working on this slide, that really Chris Benjamin and I acted as three co-chairs um, in practice. Uh, so um, we were all partners in crime in this and also editing the document too. Okay, uh, next slide. So um, just to lay out a little bit of a timeline of this brave new world of virtual conferences that we're living in, uh, we think a little bit about what happened in March through May, you know, conferences like Ask Lost, which, you know, had very little warning, uh, in, for going virtual, um, IEEE VR, SAC, as kind of the mad scramble. And these folks did amazing, you know, uh, making the most of those experiences and also kind of thinking of them as initial experiments in which we gathered a ton of useful information going forward. So big uh, uh, hats off to those folks. And then maybe now we're in phase two, we like to think, where things are a little less mad scramble and a little more creative chaos. So there's still a lot of different experiments happening with different platforms, different ways to do things, and we're still learning a lot. Um, and we are hoping that we are heading into maybe more of a phase of uh, less chaos uh, and more harvesting, polishing, consolidating what we know um, as a community. Next slide, please. Oh, right, and the, the presidential task force was very much formed at the very beginning of this mad scramble. I forgot about that, uh, nice call out. Okay, um, and so for a little background on that, um, about March 7th, uh, Krista, Benjamin, and I sent a proposal to ACM uh, for forming a task force on conference virtualization. I think we might have sent it to Pat and Vicki and Jeff Jortner, who was at the time the head, uh, the chair of the SGB. Um, and uh, ACM, uh, kudos to them, did not let uh, a lot of grass grow under their feet. Uh, Sherry Pancake, um, the president at that time, formed the ACM Presidential Task Force on what conferences can do to replace face-to-face -face meetings on March 13th, so not even a whole week. Um, and I think that title, which has a lot of words in it, both emphasized that she made the decision as the president, um, not really you know, uh, neat, uh, taking the extra time to consult tons of people, recognizing what an urgent need it was, um, and also somewhat of a desire to limit the scope of this task force um, uh, and, and ha leave some larger issues to a task force, which I believe is now being formed under Joan Feigenbaum. Um, we produced a 27-page report uh, by April 5th, so not even a whole month, and that took a huge amount of work from a lot of people, um, uh, mostly the other task members, which you see listed here below, including Vicki Hansen, Pat Ryan, and Donna Capo, who are also on this call. So uh, big shout out to them. Um, and also uh, Blair, Gary, Rob, and Francois, and other contributors as well. Um, 
And um, there is a 27 page report that was kind of snapshotted um, as the output of the task force, but the, the work of this group very much continues um, and a good way to follow that is in a live Google Doc that's pointed to by the report itself. Um, and it's now, I, I actually, I think we said it was 47 pages and growing last week at this time, but I think we've added a bunch of pages. How many pages is it now? Can anyone, anyone have it have it up? That would be a fun, like la, uh, up to the minute detail. If not, no big deal. Um, next slide. And on to Benjamin. Okay. So let's talk about, let's uh, get into the details. Um, we don't have time to tell you about everything that's in this report. There's a lot in there um, and indeed a lot that's not in there that, uh, that need some future reports. Um, but we want to give you a sense of what we came to regard as some of the biggest issues. So here are five critical things that you really have to get right to have a successful virtual conference. Um, I'll let you think for a second what you might imagine they are. And then if your first guess was people, you're right. And if your second guess was people, you're also right. Uh, people and people are really the two most important things. Any guesses what the other three are? Obviously, it's all people. So what do I actually mean by that? Well, first of all, it's not technology. The platform and all of that is important. We're going to talk about some of the, those issues today, but it's not the main issue. It's not in the first five. Uh, is it the technical program? Of course, the technical program is what the conference is built around, uh, but we kind of know how to do that. Um, and transferring the technical program into a virtual context uh, does raise some, raise some issues, but, but they're relatively easy to get right compared to these other issues. So what do I mean by these other issues? So the people uh, that organize the conference are a critical component. And uh, you absolutely cannot just uh, sort of uh, decide where the Zoom is going to happen and where, what Slack link you're going to use and advertise that and, and the rest will just happen. Uh, organizing a physical conference takes a lot of people. Organizing a virtual conference takes just as many people thinking just as hard over uh, a similar period of weeks or months. Um, then there are the people that attend the conference. And a really critical issue is keeping those people organized because when you're just sitting and staring at a screen, it's much harder to stay oriented uh, than when you're at a physical conference and somebody is you know, coming out from the room and saying, okay, the session is starting now and then the session ends and you go out and lunch is served and so on. So people really need help with this. Uh, third, I, uh, I was even tempted to put this first, the, the question of how to get people to connect at the conference is absolutely fundamental and it's absolutely not simple. So, uh, so once again, just providing a platform and expecting that people are going to use it to connect the way that they would standing around in the hallway at a conference uh, is, um, is not going to happen that way. So you really need to plan every aspect of your conference around facilitating and encouraging connection. Uh, fourth, a surprisingly challenging issue uh, is time zones. The fact that people are asleep at different times of day and in a physical conference, uh, you, can, you can kind of get around that or mitigate it by just asking everybody to get on, on airplanes and a lot of the people will be jet lagged, but they'll get over it. Uh, and then everybody's in the same place. In a virtual conference, you can't do that. Uh, and so you need to adopt different strategies. And we'll talk about some of those strategies in detail in a few minutes. Uh, and then finally, uh, another thing you need to think about is people misbehaving. Hopefully that won't happen. Uh, but as we know, people do misbehave, at least a few people misbehave, sometimes just a little bit, sometimes in serious ways at physical conferences, and that can happen just as much at virtual conferences. So you need to be aware of and think about what can happen in advance so that you're prepared if it does happen. All right, and then we're gonna go into detail about all of these things uh, in the rest of this little segment of the day. So let's talk first about the organizing and planning part. So first of all, I said this a minute ago, but I, I really want to underline it. A virtual conference is not a video conference. 
uh, a virtual conference is much bigger and more interesting and more engaging, hopefully, uh, and more complicated to organize than a video conference. So a video conference is one distinct thing or maybe multiple, a series of disconnected things. The focus is on uh, just kind of getting people into a place where they can hear and see each other. It can be unidirectional or bidirectional. Uh, the bidirectional usually doesn't work so well unless it's really tiny, um, and that's it. In a virtual conference, you have many events happening over the course of several days and they're connected. They have to do with each other and they overlap and people need to move from one to the other. Um, the social networking aspect at a conference is at least as important or to many people much more important than the formal presentations that are the backbone of the meeting. Um, this communication is happening not just during the, the technical sessions, of course, but during and around and beyond, before, after, in parallel, et cetera. Um, so people really need ways of finding out what's going on, finding out who is where. Uh, a good, not only video, but also text chat uh, is critical. It's important to have uh, ad hoc video capabilities so that people can meet in small groups or pairs. Uh, and finally, um, there's a the question of persistence of, uh, of both people and content, uh, both during and after the conference. Uh, okay, so the organizing committee. Um, the interesting thing about virtual organizing committees is that they're kind of isomorphic to physical organizing committees. That is, uh, the work that's to be done is a little different and the titles that people get may change, but uh, you need about the same collection of people and, uh, and the jobs that each person does kind of have a mapping into the physical world. So, uh, so you need some, some techie people that are responsible for the platform and those correspond to the kind of local arrangements chair. Uh, you need hosts for the video conferences, those correspond to session chairs, um, moderators, et cetera. And you will need plenty of student volunteers to keep everything running. Let's talk about people navigating. So people really need help finding out what's happening, uh, both in multi-track conferences, but even in single, smaller kind of single track events. Um, and in particular, our, uh, our urgent advice to you as organizers of conferences is you really need to broadcast the activities. There's in whatever platform you're using, there will be some kind of broadcast channel and you need, to, you need to use it loudly, enthusiastically, and often uh, to let people know, here's the next thing, or here are the next things, uh, and you know, here's what you should do next. People really need to hear that uh, often. Okay, I think the connecting part is you, Krista, is that right? Yeah. Okay, go. All right. So the, this, I believe, is number three, probably, in our list, but it's it's one of the most important things. I think that the reason why we have conferences is very much for social networking to build uh, relations and collaborations, and uh, that's one of the reasons why we have conferences. Um, next slide, Benjamin, please. All right. So. Um, the formal networking part on physical conferences is relatively easy. We know how to do. We don't need to, to be told. We, we go to a conference once and we kind of figure out exactly what how, how to function in that world. So we all go to the same physical space. We all are displaced out of our routine. Um, and, uh, and so basically the fact that we are all in the same physical space and we kind of know one or two people already that's, that kind of bring, brings us into the rest of the, of the group, uh, it's sort of the, the nat natural human thing to do. So th there's not a lot to uh, plan ahead on physical conferences with respect to networking, although people, actually some people and some conferences do plan some of these uh, events, additional events for specifically for social networking. So things like, you know, mentoring lunches or, um, you know, ad hoc kind of speed dating between people and things like that. So that, that, that even in physical conferences, uh, some some organizing committees have been doing this stuff. For, for virtual conferences, this is even more important because there is no physical space, right? People are all sitting on their computers or maybe on their couches at home in their, you know, their routine life. Uh, so social networking needs to be built in. Whatever 
small things some organizing committees were already doing for physical conferences need to be done here for sure and more. So you need to think about how will people talk to each other beyond the technical presentations, right? How, how will people bond? There's a lot of bonding going on in, in, in conferences. That's the idea, right? Make friendships. Now, how many of you have made friends over the conferences? I, I did, and I'm sure all of us have that, that, that experience. Can we somehow uh, try to capture that in virtual conferences too? How will newcomers get into the fabric of the existing community? That's very important, right? We bring students, um, uh, we want them to kind of start knowing who the people are in the community, what are the important topics, what are the important dynamics of, uh, of the group in there. Um, and uh, how will social experiences be memorable? This is kind of hard to do. I mean, if you go to physical conference, uh, you cannot really plan the memorable parts of the conference, but it's, it's very likely that something will happen that people will remember, some massive fail. Okay? The, the dinner was horrible and everybody had to go somewhere to, to have dinner or you know, some, some major epic failure happened and that will be remembered uh, for, for everybody or something really exciting happened, some famous movie star or whatever. So the, these things can, can you know, they're not guaranteed to happen all the time, but there's a high chance that something will happen at the physical conference that will make it memorable. So can we somehow make memorable experiences also in the, in the virtual uh, environment? And this is, this is super hard. You know, these are sort of open research questions for, for at least some of you uh, who study these things. Um, next slide. Um, so some suggestions, and this, this is an open-ended, uh, at least, and this, these suggestions come from earlier experiences with virtual conferences. So that, to give you a little background, I personally have been involved with virtual conferences for a long time. Uh, I, I've been involved in uh, a sort of a niche community, Open Simulator, which is sort of an immersive 3D environment, uh, like Second Life. And uh, we have been having a, an annual virtual conference since 2013. And this happens in our own platform, which is a 3D virtual environment with avatars and all that stuff, kind of em emulating a, a, a conference, a virtual conference center with everything that you can imagine. We we put it in there in virtual space. But uh, um, you know, one thing that I kind of came to realize that uh, it really is about the people, and the the, the platform kind of um, helps or or hinders, but it's the people that make the conference happen. It's not the platform. It's the engagement of the, that the people bring into the, to the, the floor that really makes it interesting. And so some, some of these things come from some of those experiences, other come from more recent experiences now with this uh, over the past few months. But so here I'm going, let me go through them. So use the organization of the conference itself as a social networking mechanism. You know, that's also what happens for physical conferences. You bring new people into the organizing committee and you start working with them. And that by naturally it becomes a way of getting to know other people. That's a really good mechanism for getting to know other people. Um, when it comes to scheduling the program, make sure to leave some space for social interaction. So don't pack the whole thing with, you know, with technical presentations with just uh, 10 minute bio breaks. Otherwise it's just basically preventing people from talking to each other. So make sure that there is space in there for people to, to connect somehow. Um, encourage presenters to be available after their talks for, for smaller chats. Um, so that's something that we, we experimented a little bit in a, a conference that I, I was organizing a few weeks ago, ICSI, um, a conference of about 1,300 people. And it was very noticeable that on the sessions where the session chair explicitly said at the end of the session, please, speakers, uh, make yourself available um, to, uh, to other people. Just go into a chat room and uh, in just make yourself available. So the, the conference, the session shares who did that versus the session shares who did not do that, there was a noticeable difference on what happened after the talk. So when, when you remind people to do that, they, then that very likely will happen. When you don't even remind it, then it won't happen for sure. Um, so uh, promote organization of birds of feather and other bottom of events. So people always want to organize things and, and it's okay to, to, to come from people who are not part of the organizing committee and that should be promoted, I think. Um, 
Uh, other thing that I also think works well for the social networking aspect is posters and demo tracks because it it encourages sort of you know small group interactions lots of parallel small group interactions is a good thing um, engage the social butterflies of your community to lead by example you know every community has those people who know everybody and who everybody knows and uh, so engaging the help of those people to show how to you know start groups and uh, start start chatting with each other and other people see that there is chatting going on and then they start feeling encouraged to do the same. So that's that's a good thing. Uh, mentoring sessions are also a good, you know, you do that, we do that in physical conferences. Uh, they also work very well in virtual conferences. Uh, another thing that uh, we've been finding out that works very well um, uh, in these recent conferences is ask me anything sessions where you bring uh, you know, famous people of some sort, and then you bring them into a intimate setting, you know, some sort of setting where the, 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 the people feel that they can have a direct access to the, the person by asking them questions or having a conversation or something. So either a Zoom meeting or, or something that uh, it's with a, sort of a one-on-one -on -one kind of interviewer, interviewee, and plus some sort of a chat where the questions come. Uh, so that works really has been working has been very popular basically on all of the conferences that i am aware of, that have been having ask me anything sessions with people with famous people those have been super popular people really appreciate them um can organize live music events there's lots of artists out there who are out of gigs uh, and it seems like a you know good opportunity to uh to have to do something interesting online there's lots of artists are totally ready to stream online you should know and so um, it, it shouldn't be very hard to uh, hire some sort of uh, entertainment program. Uh, and remind people, as uh, Benjamin said, remind people to interact at every opportunity. Um, but also, don't just say, you have to do it. So you as organizers, you know, being out there on the text chats, uh, showing interest about the program, showing interest about engaging with the with the participants. That's important. You know, once if people see that that's the dynamic, they will kind of mimic that dynamic. If if you don't do that, then people will not know that they are supposed to do that. So leading by, by example seems like a good thing too. Has been working. Next one. All right. So uh, time zones uh, is a pain in the neck. Uh, and uh, there is there are no good solutions, so that's disappointing. But uh, there are workable ones. So one thing when think about when thinking about time zones and how to organize the conference around time zones is who do you want to reach? Where where is your community? And it's true that different conferences have different uh, answers for these questions. Uh, some conferences are very localized. Uh, other conferences are spread all over the world, and so. Um, for, for different conferences, different communities, you may want to do slightly different things. So uh, you set the rhythm to serve your participants. Um, but I think that one, one thing that people should have in mind is that the force, avoid forcing people to be awake in the middle of the night because they will not be awake. So if, I mean, if you organize a conference where you put uh, the program such that it falls in the middle of the night for half of your participants, I can guarantee you that that half will not participate. Maybe a small percentage of that half will wake up there. You know, the aficionados will be motivated enough to be awake in the middle of the night, but most people will not, you know, people will children would not be awake in the middle of the night. So um, you have to think of alternatives. And uh, there are lots of interesting creative things that people are doing. So uh, let me go through some of them. Um, next slide. Uh, so one thing that that you can do is just, especially if you if the, your community is localized in some geographical area, a single time zone might be okay. Maybe with the expectation that the time zone will change over the years. If you're if you go virtual many times, maybe one year you do it on the European time zone, another year you do it on the American time zone, another year you do it on Asian time zone, and you go you distribute the pain around the globe over time. Uh, another approach was the one that we did for ICSI, which was the follow the sun. So we for, for six days, we had 24 hour uh, cycle things. So we had uh, for three hours, um, 
we are two thirds of the world are awake and it's also, it's possible okay, to have three hours where two thirds of the world are awake and they overlap. So we had, we, um, I'll, I'll explain a little bit more about that. Another thing that uh, ICFP is doing is some sort of a mirrored schedule. So they have a, the program on for where half of the world is awake and then they have the, the sort of exact same program, sort of, not exact, but almost the same on the other, uh, you know, on the other side of the world, uh, 12, 12 hours later. So let me um, explain a little bit next. Um, so the follow the sun, which is the, the one that we need for this, is a little complicated and it requires a, a fair amount of, uh, you know, of organization and you have to have people in um, at least two of these three parts of the world. And basically we divide the world into three time bands. The, the Pacific time band, which will be centered around the Pacific, Ocean. So it gets the Americas and Asia and uh, Australia. Uh, we have uh, the Indian time zone that gets it's centered on the Indian Ocean. It gets the Asia and Australia and uh, Europe. Um, and then the Atlantic time zone uh, centered on the Atlantic that gets Europe and, uh, and the Americas. And so uh, we, we had basically for six days, we had three hours you know, here on this time zone, another three hours on the next one, another three hours on the next one, and this went on for six for six days. Um, but you have to have people to host the, you know, the, the conference, to host the sessions, to be there, uh, to kind of direct, to organize, you know, to serve as organizers uh, in each of these things. So for ICSI, we actually had the small regional teams in each of these time zones, three of them. Uh, I, I, technically, it is possible to do it even if you have just people in just two of these, because uh, you know the way that this is set up is pe it, some for everybody. Some part of the conference happens in the morning, and some part of the conference happens at the end of the of the day. So it, we are awake, okay? So you can take care of both of things uh, either in the morning or at the end of the day. Um, so, but it it definitely requires a lot of organization for for doing this well. Next one, Benjamin. Uh, the mirror schedule is basically, you know, you, you, you have whatever, six hours or something of program uh, for half of the world. And then 12 hours later, you have the same program for the other half of the people. And the hope here, we haven't really tried this. I, ICFP is going to try this in August. Let's see how it works. But the hope is that, for example, the authors whose papers are going to be discussed on that particular day, uh, might be motivated enough to wake up in the middle of the night and also talk with the other side of the world who is awake and uh, listening to a, a recording video of their paper, for example. Let's see how this works, uh, how many authors actually wake up in the middle of the night. So is it just to tell you that there's some creative experiments that I think we need to start doing because um, people are going to be asleep and we need to figure out how to have a, a global con global conferences in this um, in this fact that people are going to be asleep in the middle of the night. Next one. All right, so this is where I pass the baton again to Gina. Thanks, Krista. Um, so as Benjamin mentioned, we can't uh, go over all the things in the documents, uh, but one other thing we especially wanted to highlight was the problem of people misbehaving. So issues of privacy and security. And um, the biggest advice we'd like to give in this space is to actively prepare to deal with disruption. Um, when you are, when you set up a plan and a set of platforms and meeting configurations, because as I'm sure we all know, there's a lot of little knobs and things that you can adjust in Zoom and many, many platforms. You know, when you have a set of chosen platforms and all those detailed configurations, really test them out from the perspective of a deliberately disruptive attendee. You know, try accidental unmuting, try disruptive screen sharing or Zoom bombing as they call it. Try putting an offensive virtual background or renaming your name to an offensive name or maybe the you know, name of a distinguished member of the community. Um, I know in Zoom, for example, there's a way you can start using annotations to start scribbling all over the screen if that's not turned off. Um, and I'm sure we'll all learn all these different little niche areas of each platform, uh, maybe the painful way over time, but the more you can really stress test it, the better off you're gonna be. 
Um, and another point is also something Benjamin said about just needing a lot of people and uh, on hand besides the speaker just like in a physical conference you wouldn't expect the speaker to be dealing with all of that stuff in a virtual conference you can't expect the speaker to be monitoring the chat and dealing with people's connection and audio video issues and dealing with disruptions so having people on hand who are prepared to deal with disruptions pulling people out into breakout rooms if necessary or whatever the case may be is a really good idea next slide please Um, another thing that we really recommend is having an explicit code of conduct. I know as a community, we've gotten a little better about having code of conduct explicitly for our physical events, um, and, but consider doing that for the virtual events as well. And a code of conduct that lays out expected behavior for both hosts and participants. So for example, are the hosts going to be recording? What are they going to be recording? What's going to be done with those recordings? How long will the recordings be retained? Will they be posted? Will they be shared? It, with who, in what way? Um, how are attendees being observed? Are you doing any other data collection? There was that one Zoom option to track attendee attention that got a lot of negative press because it was basically just focused on the amount of time an application was in the foreground. And of course, there's a lot of reasons you might put something in the background if you're taking notes or whatever and still be very actively engaged. Another big one is how long will the chat log be retained? Many people don't realize that hosts in Zoom, for example, have access to private chats. And if they don't realize that, that's not cool. So basically, hosts should be clear about the way in which participants are going to be served, what data is going to be collected, and how and how long it will be kept and who will have access to it. And also, um, while there's not a lot you can do to utterly prevent attendees from doing things like taking a million screenshots and posting them all over the internet or you know doing other types of audio visual video recordings you should say in the code of conduct what is expected for example is it okay to take a screenshot for personal use probably right is it okay for posting maybe not you know but regardless you should be very clear so that if people violate community expectations you have a clear document to point back to it's not just a matter of could they technically do it with their, you know, you know, freedom of, you know, choosing their own behavior? There's a code of conduct that they agreed to that you can point back to and say, you know, you, you agreed to this code of conduct and you shouldn't be uh, posting those kind of uh, recordings or things like that. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so this one isn't so much of a, um, well, it's a, it's a wish list item is what it is. I would really like us as a, as a, a whole community to be um, using this time to collect apples to apples comparison data the most we can. So I would really love us to have a core of shared questions that obviously any conference can add to or remove or modify to their heart's content. But you know, if we can, could suggest a set of core questions, and maybe a standard collection and aggregation process so that we can do some analysis across um, our SIGs and conferences. I, I think that would be a really good investment in all of the decisions that we as a community are going to need to make about uh, virtual conferences going forward. And I really don't think this is a, a lot more work to do. Um, a lot of the conferences that have already done have done some great surveys. Um, and you know, folks on the task force and people organizing those conferences have already put a lot of thought into some good questions. I really think it's only a matter of a couple hours of work to get this more regularized in a web page that has a suggestion and you know ideas for putting it together. If anybody listening on this call would like to help volunteer to do some of that, we would love it. Um, we're all feeling a little um, uh, overwhelmed with many of the things that we're, we have going on. Uh, but we'll still try to get to it, even if not. Okay, uh, last slide is a set of resources um, that I really want to orient everyone to. Um, the only one that I actually listed the URL straight out for is the one I think you actually might remember, and that's basically acm.org slash virtual dash conferences. So most of the things I'm, a, I'm going to tell you are linked somehow off of that page. One exception is this first thing, which I'll point up 
placed in the chat right now is an article we wrote, um, five things to consider before going virtual. Um, it actually will, should sound pretty familiar, uh, given that we've hit many of those points um, in, the, in this presentation. Uh, maybe Donna, we could also put a link to this article off the page you're building. Um, and then uh, Benjamin, I don't know if you'd be willing to pull up the uh, ACM.org virtual conferences. We could just look at it together. Um, I, I could, or, but, but maybe we should try to wind up and leave some time for discussion. Okay. So basically, if you go there, you'll see that there's a live Google Doc that you, anybody can edit. So, it, you know, um, that's where you should look, not the, the static PDF. And there's also a discussion forum where uh, we're trying to uh, put um, questions that come to us in email. And I also really want to point out that uh, the Technology Policy Council group, specifically the U.S. Techn Technology Policy Group, USTPC, uh, we put together a statement of principles for security and privacy in virtual meetings and thinking a bit more broadly about virtual meetings, whether they be, you know, um, not just our conferences, but, you know, there's a lot of people doing all sorts of things from medical appointments and counseling and religious services. And there's also a, li a longer live Google Doc uh, for that as well. So with that, uh, we'd be happy to take some questions. Very good. Thanks to the task force leaders. Uh, uh, I will start with some questions from the chat. And then everyone, if you want to ask a question, either press raise hand or, or type in your, your question. So I start with a, a question from Elko who, who writes, um, is there a threshold from which uh, you should expect that people are misbehaving? At Hotech, 80 participants, you with 180 participants. The conferences really have a strong core community, and, and there was no misbehaving, as far as Elko knows. Any thoughts? I mean, I'd really like to think we're not going to have misbehavior at any of our events. I think the larger it is, the more likely you might get some misbehaving. The more we don't even have registration or any, any, um, uh, any cost to join, we might get even more of that. But I think regardless, you ought to, unless you're pretty clear who's going to be in like an invitation meeting like this, we wouldn't expect any, any misbehavior. But I, I think you'd, you'd be wise to have someone on hand to deal with it and have them at least practice getting people out into a breakout room quick. Some, you know. The main thing is it's, it's important to be able to know who people are. And you'd be surprised the degree to which you can rename yourself or look like something else, you know, impersonate, you know, just try to be cussed once and you'll see how, how easy it is. <laughs> um, and think a little about what you'd do if somebody did that. All right. Other question from, uh, from Alex. Um, how many people treat virtual conferences as something temporary? Or are we likely to move towards some form of hybrid conferences forever? where forever is, I guess, just means for a long, long time. Um, and uh, should we start exploring virtual conferences from this, this potential perspective? Thoughts? So, so of course, nobody knows the answer to that. But here's a guess. Uh, I think I, I will personally be very surprised if there are a lot of physical conferences happening before next summer. And I will be a little bit surprised uh, if it even happens that soon. But even if we do, uh, it's going to be, so that's a lot of virtual conferences between now and then. Yep. And I think even when we do begin having physical conferences, we are going to be moving uh, toward this, some kind of a hybrid model, maybe alternating between physical and virtual or somehow trying to mix qualities of physical and virtual. Um, one thing to be careful of though is, uh, so virtual conferences are hard. Uh, we don't know much about it. It's kind of uh, terra incognita. Uh, we're, we're learning our way. We're beginning to have some understanding, but it's still really early days. Um, and, and I think people are finding it's, it's harder or at least as hard as physical conferences to get right. Hybrid conferences are yet another order of magnitude uh, harder because you have all of the challenges of physical and all of the challenges of virtual and all of the challenges of somehow making them play together or making it okay that they're not playing together or whatever. So, uh, so I do believe we're going to go through a phase where there will be a lot of experimentation with hybrid conferences, um, but I don't expect it to be pretty at the beginning. 
Um, yeah. Also mentioned that last week, Joan Feigenbaum, who is uh, one of the, the officers for the next two years, said virtual conferences are never going away, I think. Didn't she say that? Yeah, very close, very close. And I think she's the chair of the, the new wider, uh, you know, the, the virtual conference task force that has a wider mission um, to really look at, you know, all sorts of things about ACM finances and, you know, how that plays in with the digital life, all sorts of things, right? Um, and she says they're never going away. No. I, okay. I, I got that right. Uh, in the chat, the multiple conferences report about no, no misbehavior for, for large conferences, which, which is good to hear. And then a few Zoom bombers here and there. Question from Shen. Uh, any suggestion about the registration fee for a virtual conference? We talked about I mean, that last week too. I don't know. Krista, do you want to take that one? Sure. So, uh, so, so, so far, there's, the conferences have been all over the place with registration fees. <clears throat> there are conferences that basically just remove registration fees entirely. And then there are conferences that have fee structures that are almost similar to physical conferences um, and everything in between. So I, I, think, I think that's going to be a very hot topic for the ACM to figure out this, you know, a, 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 some part of the revenue of the ACM comes from um, the physical conferences, as you know, the, the, some of the overhead that we pay to the ACM to do the good things that the ASM does comes from the expenses that the conferences have. The finances of virtual conferences are very different, at least right now. Um, I mean, the expenses are at, at least one order of magnitude less, maybe more, uh, maybe more than one order of magnitude less for the big conferences. Uh, once you eliminate the hotel and food and beverage, it's a big chunk that just goes away. And so some conferences are, you know, you, we kind of have to relearn how to do the budget for virtual conferences. And uh, the, the good thing about about virtual conferences is that in terms of the sponsors and sponsorships, um, there doesn't seem to be a lot of difference. I think they are still interested in participating. They're still interested in contributing and sponsor the conference. In many cases, exactly to the same levels that they would in the physical conference. Um, so some conferences have been able to cover all their expenses entirely by the sponsorships. Um, and so they just make the registrations be zero. Other conferences have been trying to cover the losses of like the penalties of hotels, for example. And, and so they, they, have, they still have uh, registration fees. Um, I guess we're just gonna have to learn. Uh, but basically a rule of thumb, once we pass the, this, this this phase of hotel losses and stuff like that. The rule of thumb is that what the registration, if there is registration fees, it should be such that it covers the expenses. That's for sure. So, you know, the, the, the whole sum of the sponsorships plus the registration fees should cover all the expenses and perhaps give also the overhead to the ACM. That's sort of a rule of thumb. Uh, how exactly those numbers are going to look like, I don't know. Okay, uh, let me uh, move to a comment by Ali who talk about uh, the cost of Zoom webinar. So Donna to told me that uh, ACM has Zoom licenses. Uh, they have uh, maybe uh, up to about 100 licenses for meetings up to 500 people. They have some licenses for meetings up to 1,000 people and they have one license for meetings up to 3,000 people. So that's, that's something to consider and um, uh, you can always write to Donna or to your liaison for your sake to, to find out how to get to those licenses. My, I hear that many of them are used uh, quite a bit, but of course, the better we get to understand how to get them, the more we can use them. Okay, another question from Peter who asks, uh, what about all the research on conference support for virtual conferences going on, particularly in CHI? Is that part of your recommendations for best practices? So some of the members of the task force are uh, have been involved with uh, Kai for a long time. So uh, Gary Olson was part of the task force. Um, he he and Judy have been, you know, the, their career is about remote collaboration, and and a lot of the people who are not officially part of the task force but who contributed to the report because we shared it around quite uh, extensively. Uh, we have people from from Kai and we had people from access you know the accessibility aspect of virtual conferences it's all in there mm. 
Mm -hmm. Okay, a uh, question from Elko who asks, um, so, uh, so Benjamin moved very quickly from the technical program to talk about people a whole lot, but, but um, uh, what about uh, the idea that, that these live interactive presentations with, with extended question and answer sessions um, could, could be a good core for, um, for a conference? and for people to meet and discuss. What, what do you think about that, that idea? So I, I responded in the chat already, and, and I'll say more or less what I said there. Uh, I, I absolutely did not mean to say that the technical program was not important. Uh, and I apologize if it came out that way. Um, what I did mean to say was that although the technical, adjusting the technical program and the presentation of the technical program uh, to a virtual setting, it does present some challenges, and it's something that you need to think about and uh, and put some energy into figuring out. Um, it is uh, it is less um, uh, it will throw you for less of a loop. Uh, it's uh, the the issues that will come up and the solutions to them uh, are more kind of things that you would think of as an organizing committee, uh, and there are nice tools available um, for addressing a lot of those issues already. Can so, I, can I? so uh, yeah, please, I'll go. So, so I think, I mean, so I, I think we know how to do the technical program in uh, in a physical space, but I think for a virtual conference, it may be more important uh, because it is it is the point where we can meet, right? So, in a, in a physical conference, you run into other people. Mm -hmm. In a virtual conference, that's much harder because you don't know where they are or when they are, right? Right. Yep. I think the the technical program may be. The point where you can meet uh, other people who are interested in, this, in the same stuff. Okay, so very good, thank you. Uh, so the, there's the technical program that is the talks, and then you're completely right to point out that there's the technical program. There's the there's the uh, the halo around the talks, that is things like the Q and A sessions uh, and uh, that happen at the end of talks, and maybe the longer discussion sessions that happen at the end of the session that uh, where, you know, everybody clusters at the front of the room and, um, and goes to lunch together and, and has a, a long conversation. Uh, and, uh, and those are things that are, are indeed part of the brave new world that we're, that we're still figuring out. So one thing that's changed, just a, a simple example, is that, um, is that there's this choice between pre-recorded talks or live talks. And, uh, and of course, live talks, we would we would tend to assume from our experience of physical conferences that live talks are better. In some ways, of course, they are. There's a sense of kind of being there with the speaker as they're speaking. On the other hand, uh, there are some hidden benefits to pre-recorded talks, like uh, you can mirror them in the other time zone, uh, and so so a whole different group of people can have a, a conversation centered around that talk um, at a different time, and. Uh, during the talk, if it's pre-recorded, uh, the author can be on the chat, on the text chat uh, that's associated with the space that the talk is happening in, and can answer questions in real time by text. Can so, I, can I respond to that? So it's a it's a different mode, but uh, but and and something that we need to think about and experiment with. Yeah, I mean, so, so I think for for the recording, you can record a live talk, right, and replay it. Mm -hmm. And uh, if even if, if the talk is live, it will not be as as smooth as the um, as the pre-recorded talks. I mean, that the, there were production I mean, at PLEI, the talks were very good, but they're they're too fast, right? I mean, and uh, I think a live talk is slower, and, and you can interact with people. And I think another opportunity we have with virtual conferences is that um, in a physical conference uh, we are limited by the number of rooms we have, right? I mean. The, there's three parallel tracks because we have that many physical rooms. That's right. Uh, but often there's not that many, uh, I don't want to see the whole track. So we could have much longer sessions for uh, where, where people interested in the same topic could discuss on paper uh, in parallel, right? I mean, so I think there, there are new modes of organizing the, co the, the technical program that play uh, that can play the role of of the, the hallway track in uh, if you see what I mean. and they I, are I completely I completely withdraw my dismissal of the technical track we should absolutely consider it as part of the uh, the connecting and communicating part very good right. let, let me right. take one last question before we uh, move on to to the next session here um, so uh, uh, Peter asked 
make a point if I could. Oh, um, yeah, go ahead, make a point. Um, I think one thing that we need to grapple with is the way in which we're redefining the role of an author at a conference. Um, and we may be asking authors to do a lot of new things. We might be asking them to do a pre-recorded talk and a couple of live talks and a couple of live chats and monitor a Discord channel for two weeks. And all of that could be okay. I think authors generally want to publicize their work and engage broadly. But I think we have to have that concrete conversation so that, that authors are actually signing up for being recorded in that way and being present in all those ways. It also might be an opportunity to um, have more than one, more than just the first author engage. Maybe there's authors in different time zones that attend different times. And we also need to decide what of this is going to be recorded and go down on the permanent record versus being just an ephemeral experience that you had at a given time. And before I yield the floor, I just want to quickly flip through. Um, this is the page, the virtual conferences page. And many of these things, if you click on them, you will get a PDF document. Um, and sometimes that PDF document has links to live Google Docs. Um, like here is this security and privacy's live Google Doc. Um, in the PDF, there's a link to the actual live one where you can edit. And there's also this virtual conferences forum um, where people can ask questions. I just wanted to make sure to put all of those different resources in people's brain. I Very good. Okay, one final question here uh, from Peter who says, uh, so far we heard a lot about uh, the prospects and experience from organizers, but what about surveys analyzing the user needs? Is there any experience out there about that? That's part of my wish list item, my last uh, wish list item, we need more of that. I, what about I, conference organizers on the call who did it? Any experiences with? Analyzing the needs. Well, I mean, uh, people have been doing post-conference surveys, not pre-conference surveys. Um, I've been uh, privy to some of them. Um, I can share some 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 common the, the answers to some common questions, especially the changing tide. I think with respect to the, uh, uh, that people uh, look at virtual conferences. I think there's a changing tide right now happening. Uh, that uh, that people seem to actually be pleasantly surprised with uh, with what went on. So th they are they are now uh, it seems amenable to changing their minds with respect to how should we proceed in the future? Should it, should we go back to all physical conferences once COVID is over, or should now uh, virtual conferences be part of a um, spectrum of of options? And it seems like uh, most participants are leaning towards the latter that it should be part of a spectrum of op of options from here on. Very good. Many thanks. Okay, so uh, we are uh, we will return to questions later, but for now I turn it over to Krista, who will be your session chair for going over a whole bunch of recent virtual conferences. That's right. And I have a question. So in the schedule, we were supposed to start uh, 15 minutes ago. Is that true? Yeah, that is true. So okay. All right. We'll do, we'll do our best. So that's okay. questions. We're enjoying it. So go ahead. <laughs> that's right. So. Uh, in this part of the meeting, uh, we're going to go through some experiences uh, for conferences uh, from seven, well, seven conferences uh, that have happened already. And I would ask, I hope everybody's here, but I would ask all of the presenters to please focus on the or organization and participation experience rather than just focusing on the tools. There's a, a, a separate session here for talking about tools. But what I would like to hear, I think what everybody would like to hear is how large was your conference? How many days did it, did it go uh, on? What did you do about time zones? Uh, how, what did you do about the program? How did you organize the, how did, how did you deliver the program? How, how did people interact? So the, the, all of this part, right? And, in, and of course, it, this is related with the technology and it's, you know, it's very much related, but, uh, but uh, let's, let's focus on sort of the architecture of your, of your conferences and the experience, both for the organizers and the participants. That, that would be very useful, I think. So we start with SIGOPS uh, for EuroCs. And that would be uh, Shan Lu. Yeah, so Costas, the general chair of URSIS will do the first part of the presentation. I will follow up with something quick after that. Well, hi everyone. Um, I'm sharing my slides. Um, 
Uh, can you let me know if it's uh, visible to everyone? Yes, you are not in presentation mode, but that's okay. Oh, now you is are. it okay now? Yeah. Okay. Well, hi everyone. This is a report on uh, Eurosys 20. This is the 15th European Conference on Computer Systems. Um, my name is Kostas Magoudis. I'm, I'm the general co-chair, uh, one of the co-chairs of um, uh, Eurosys. Uh, first, this was supposed to happen on the 27th, uh, 27th to 30th of April uh, 2020 um, in Iraklion in uh, Crete. Um, it, it did happen on the same dates, uh, but uh, totally virtually. Uh, it was uh, one of the first conferences to fall into this uh, um, sort of virtual conference uh, wave. And um, we, uh, first of all, let me acknowledge we had great support from, from ACM, from all around ACM. And also we're lucky enough to find the Presidential Task Force report on virtual conferences, which was very, very helpful. So thanks, uh, thanks for that. Um, let me say that we wrote a report on uh, Eurosys 20, uh, 2020. This is uh, available. Uh, you can just look up uh, the title on uh, Google. That will get you to the uh, into an archive uh, PDF. Uh, and it's, um, I think it's a nice report of um, everything, all the experience and the lessons uh, learned. Um, the authors are the general chairs, Angelos, myself, and Evangelos. Uh, Dayan and Margo were the program chairs. and. Uh, Peter and the, uh, uh, the Eurosys uh, chair and vice chair who were uh, very, very helpful uh, along the lines. So the decision to go virtual. Uh, well, ASPLOS, uh, we saw that ASPLOS was going um, uh, virtual. That was uh, very new to us. Uh, we really had no idea uh, what uh, were, uh, how this would uh, evolve. We started discussing uh, about in the early March uh, how to respond, uh, taking into account everything that was going on. Um, so here it was critical uh, that um, all the organizers, uh, the extended team came together very nicely. I think in situations like that, it's important to have good chemistry among people, uh, to, uh, to be able to, to work well. Of course, time zones were an issue here as well because uh, people were involved uh, pretty much on every time zone. So even finding times to, uh, to have health calls was, was a challenge. But eventually it worked out, we discussed things well. We decided to involve the community, the Eurosys community. We ran an online uh, survey um, and eventually we got back uh, very nice uh, feedback, uh, which was pointing the direction that we had to cancel the physical conferences. We took that decision, we communicated uh, uh, early on, and that was, I think, uh, very, very nice for everyone. They knew what was going on. Of course, what was unclear was uh, how, to, how, to, how to go about, should we postpone or should we go fully virtual? But we didn't know what, uh, what that meant. Uh, it took us some time to brainstorm about um, uh, virtual conferences. Uh, let me thank again the task force, uh, the ACM task force on that. Uh, that was helpful and we decided to go virtual, but then we only had three weeks to, to organize it. So this is a case where uh, it really, uh, we, we really squeezed uh, a lot of output you know, out of a very little time. Uh, so the, the goal here was to provide an interactive uh, conference experience um, uh, while uh, using also side, uh, side channel information exchange. We decided to use Zoom for, for synchronous sessions in webinar mode. Uh, let me just say that we had no uh, misbehavior in uh, webinar mode. That was, that was very nice. That was for the main track. Our uh, workshops, uh, there, there were some reported uh, uh, issues, but they ran in uh, meeting mode. So that was uh, uh, the problem there, but not, not, not for us. Uh, so it was everything ran, uh, ran well. Um, the, uh, the format was to uh, use, uh, to stream pre-recorded presentations and then have live uh, Q&A sessions um, after these pre-recorded uh, presentations. We decided to ask uh, for two versions of uh, the presentations, a, a short one, uh, three to five minutes, uh, which was supposed to, to be to run uh, during the conference and a longer one, a 10 to 14 minutes, that was supposed to be used by uh, attendees uh, to get more information about the talks. Uh, we wanted those to be available about a week before the conference so that the attendees were uh, prepared for the, 
uh, for the conference itself, we managed to put them up uh, a few days before, uh, two or three days before the conference. Uh, now, remember that uh, having these two versions of, the, uh, of each presentation was, in, was important. It was more work for the, uh, for the authors, uh, but it allowed us to experiment with uh, talk duration, uh, so that was useful for the organizers. In terms of asynchronous uh, chat channels, we used uh, Slack, which seems to be a common, a popular choice. Uh, we also uh, decided to experiment with uh, Discord. Uh, to uh, to get uh, a different uh, you know, type of um, um, platform and experiment with it, to have discussion among the attendees and also um, sort of have hosted virtual meetings uh, to sort of go closer to what uh, to the hallway uh, uh, track. Uh, what we found was uh, these uh, channels are also important for coordination between the organizers. So that was uh, very important for us as well. Um, again, this board was used for uh, to get, get closer to the hallway track filling to have synchronous virtual meetings with hosted discussions. So as we uh, decided to uh, prepare for that, again, people uh, are key. Um, thanks for pointing that out. And uh, uh, so we assigned, uh, we mapped out the roles, the tasks and the roles and what needed to be done. Uh, the ACM task force report was also important for that. Uh, we assigned the role of the Zoom master to, uh, to a single person that was a, a technically savvy uh, person uh, who uh, uh, unfortunately took a lot of load. Um, this is a feedback for all the organizers. Uh, the Zoom master, you know, it better be distributed among, you know, uh, more than one person. It tends to be a bottleneck. Um, and so the Zoom master, of course, had the main uh, command on uh, Zoom, but also had to uh, interface with the registration system, in fact, create a registration system, registration forms, codes of conduct, and so forth, mailing lists. It ended up being a lot of work. Now, of course, it, it did work out, uh, but it would have done it a little bit more scalably. Uh, we had a team of volunteers, a Zoom co-hosts, that were trained by the master, and they, uh, each of them was uh, in um, um, sort of uh, um, uh, or, uh, working with workshop organizers and running um, each of the workshops. Uh, they also, during the main track, they uh, worked on monitoring and on collecting statistics about um, attending, about uh, um, sort of how things went, uh, announcing things. Uh, again, uh, you know, it was pointed out earlier that announcing things uh, is, is key. Uh, sort of come on coming uh, going out and shouting um, session starts and so forth uh, doing that on slack was was important just to keep the heartbeat going you know, of, of the conference uh, having um, people that would produce uh, content that would uh, operate the media whether the media was a slack channel or Twitter or uh, um, else or on zoom in fact uh, so playing a video after after a session uh, that was very well received um, so it is important to have uh, people that, would, uh, um, that, that can take over that, that part and do it, uh, and do it well. Uh, it is important, to, we found out, to produce information for presenters and for session chairs uh, early on and let them know about what they have to do. Uh, in fact, we posted the detailed instructions on the website of the conference and uh, we found that uh, presenters and session chairs were very happy to uh, read up you know what they had to do uh, they came up with a, with a couple of questions but mostly this uh, this went very smoothly they were all aware of what what they had to do in terms uh, of so attendance sorry to interrupt costas we have sure. about uh, one one minute one minute and a half for your presentation okay uh, it's uh, really quick uh, just a couple of slides so um, we had a lot of registrations. So first of all, free registration because we did very well with sponsors, so we, we could afford to have uh, uh, to offer free registration. Uh, more than a thousand people registered. Uh, real attendance uh, picked at 240, uh, and it ranged between 100 and 150 after uh, after that, uh, kind of spread over the conference. Um, if we didn't have that, that sponsorship, we may have uh, to think harder about uh, what to charge. But I think we could have uh, could have done that. Uh, this is a shot on, on the program. Uh, it wasn't around uh, follow, follow the sun. Uh, in fact, thanks for that suggestion. You know, we could have tried it. Uh, it, it would have made it much longer, uh, but then this was quite dense. 
Uh, we did it in a 2.25 days, um, right? But uh, it was uh, closer to a traditional uh, conference format. Uh, it was aligned to the uh, speaker time zone. Uh, but then, um, uh, you know, it, it was an issue for people who were sleeping while their uh, favorite, favorite station was, uh, was on. So lessons learned. Uh, time zone was was an issue. Uh, I, I'm like, happy to hear there are uh, proposals. Uh, thanks for that. Program test density was uh, was an issue. Uh, we could have done something about that. Uh, we we got positive feedback on session format. Uh, in fact, we decided to do longer uh, talks because uh, that seemed to convey more content. So the Q and A was more meaningful with with longer. Uh, uh, talks. So I would suggest uh, going more than 10 minutes, less than 15. Uh, live Q&A was not as, uh, as as extensive as we would have hoped, but still there was a sense of a real event, a uh, real-time event. So that was very uh, well appreciated. Uh, there was positive feedback on a asynchronous platforms. So, so Slack was uh, was used significantly. So it was it was a lot of uh, a lot of traffic, a lot of exchange. Also as a back channel for organizers. So keep, keep that in mind. This is very, very uh, useful for coordinate, coordinating um, for organizers. The distractions and remote participation, it's, uh, it is an issue. Also for organizers, uh, there's a lot of activity going on, a lot of feedback uh, with, with, with these um, uh, channels. People feel free to just voice any issue they have, any, any, any minor comment. And the organizers feel obliged not to, to respond to that, or they should at least. But this sometimes requires an army of people to, to attend to every little note uh, that, that comes out on these channels. So workshops uh, increase the level of difficulty because you have to replicate all you, what you do, uh, what, you, what you plan to do for the main track for every single workshop, so it multiplies complexity. Registration system is important. We, have, we built our own, uh, but integration was, uh, was an issue and that overloaded our, our, our Zoom master. So let me just close uh, saying that uh, this fact was, uh, was high. In fact, it was uh, really, uh, really high. It was about 85% of the people were satisfied or very satisfied with, uh, with the conference. Uh, there was a similar result on the question, uh, was this better than what you expected? In fact, either the bar was too low or we did a great job, or both, in fact. Um, so uh, the results were great. And uh, I'm closing with a screenshot uh, of the closing session. These, these are the panelists, uh, uh, some of the organizers, session chairs, and uh, local organization people. And with that, let me just point again to the full report, which is easily, yeah, you can find it easily, either through a link on the PDF on the uh, Presidential Task Force report, or just by, just by Googling uh, the uh, conference uh, title. Thank you. So, um, Shan, do you have something else to say? Yeah, so actually, can I just say uh, very briefly, um, so urgent, I, I want to talk about the virtual PC meeting. Um, because right now, more and more, uh, a lot of conferences, their PC meeting was original physical, and then the conference is virtual, and now more and more conferences have to schedule virtual PC meeting. Um, and uh, uh, I guess I don't have time to, to, to present my slides. I just want to leave this question here. And particularly, um, in the one virtual conference PC meeting we had in USNIX ATC, there were a lot of challenge about how to communicate during the PC meeting. And people found that Zoom is very bad of doing communication. For example, you cannot clear the chatting history after one paper is discussed. Right? And it's also, um, people find that uh, it's hard to send a private message to multiple people. Like if I want to send to message to other reviewer of the paper, that is hard. Um, so, and also how to, you know, have people leave the, the uh, to break up room also takes time to set up. I would just stop here and I would, uh, I would love to hear if other people have good idea about the virtual, virtual PC meeting. Excellent. So I'm going to uh, exercise my, my authority as session chair to just establish the rules because we have eight uh, conference reports and we have 80 minutes. So everybody needs to stick to 10 minutes. And what I would encourage though, is to use that this horrible chat of Zoom that we have here that everybody agrees it's horrible. But please type your comments and questions as the, the presenters are presenting their material. And then what I would encourage is the presenters then to go after your talks, 
scan the chat and continue the conversation over text for for those uh, for those questions that popped up. Okay, we have also a little bit of questions at, a time of questions at the end, but it's going to be everything together. Otherwise, we'll not have time to go through everything. So those are the rules of engagement. So uh, Sigark and uh, presenting what happened with Iska. So you have ten minutes. Uh, thank you, uh, Krista. Uh, I'll try to. Uh, focus on the, the most uh, important things. This case, uh, International Symposium on Computer Architecture, and I'm going to talk about the architecture of how we organize the, the, the conference itself. Uh, well, first of all, can you hear me correctly? Yes. Okay, good. So, some key decisions. First of all, uh, we decided to go virtual when we realized that uh, multiple companies were preventing people to schedule uh, flights for the uh, time we uh, plan uh, to hold the, the, the conference. So either we had to delay the conference, that was not a good idea because uh, there are other conferences on computer architecture. There are four over the year and they are spaced approximately three months. So the, uh, moving the conference was not a good idea. So we decided to go virtual. Once we went virtual, the first important decision was about registration fees. We didn't want the authors to pay for most of the registration fees. We didn't want most of the expenses to go on the on the authors. And uh, we had the, the pressure from IEEE in order to prepare the budget so that the only guaranteed attendees were the authors. So they were asking us to, uh, to, to, to prepare the budget by counting only on the income from uh, author registration fees. The decision was the following one. We decided to... Uh, Establish the same restriction fees for everybody, for authors and, and attendees. Uh, basically, it was $30 for uh, all the, the members, and twice as much if people were non members, and half that much if they were students and, uh, and members. So, uh, in case uh, students were non members of uh, ACM or IEEE, uh, then it was $30. So, once we made the decision, how do we prepare the budget? The way we prepared the budget was the following one. We realized that uh, both IEEE and ACM used to uh, uh, provide uh, support for uh, student uh, trips so that they uh, grant uh, students who are camping for the trip. And we used that, that, uh, those funds for, uh, for grants as part of the, the budget. We asked for permission, they granted us, since they, nobody was going to travel. So we used that in order to be able to prepare the budget. Because we expect a lot of attendees and uh, we expect a lot of surplus. So the problem was just preparing the budget and getting it accepted by IEEE. So we got uh, $15,000 uh, um, as, as, uh, as this additional uh, budget and uh, by taking this into account, I will provide more details on the budget later. We're able to prepare the budget and set the same restriction fees for uh, everybody and set them very low at $30, as I said. Second important decision was to hold the conference in 2021 in the same place and with the same general co-chairs. And I will explain the uh, reasons uh, for this later on in another slide. Then about time slots, we selected three time slots. We didn't want repeated program. We, we didn't want to mirror the schedule because uh, that implied uh, an extra effort uh, from the authors. So we uh, selected three time slots. The main time slot was basically valid for everybody. It was uh, 10 uh, to noon uh, New York time. That means uh, uh, 10 p.m. to uh, midnight for, for Asia but it was basically acceptable for everybody around the, the planet. And then two additional slots, one at uh, uh, 12 to 14, uh, again, uh, New York time, another one at uh, 20 to 22, so 8 to 10 p.m. The second one was bad for Asia and the third one was bad for Europe. So how do we take care of people living in those parts of the, the planet? What we did is uh, we prepared a fleet format. Instead of uh, the traditional conference format, what we did is uh, to ask all the authors to pre-record the presentations. 
So the authors uh, pre-recorded all the presentations and uh, they submitted all those videos and we uh, added the, the videos and the full papers to the tools we're, uh, we're using so that people could access those uh, full papers and pre-recorded presentations one week in advance. So they had one week to access all of that information. And additionally, they were able to submit questions by typing those questions during that whole week. Then, at the time uh, for, for the, the, the conference in, in the main uh, and, and additional sessions, what we did is to devote uh, four minutes for a short uh, line session, uh, line presentation. So it was kind of a short introduction to the, to the topic, a kind of reminder. And then we devoted 10 uh, minutes for uh, questions and answers. We uh, encourage the, uh, the session chairs to take care of the, the questions, to read the questions loudly for the, the authors so that they could uh, answer those, those questions. And in case they were, there were no questions, that they uh, had some uh, prepared questions, they could ask the, the authors. And all of the session chairs did wonderfully and at no time, people were just uh, waiting for the next paper because uh, there were uh, questions all the time. So we, uh, we wanted all the, the, the questions to be asked through the same interface, but unfortunately, one of the tools we used uh, had some uh, delay, one to two minutes delay, and it was not uh, suitable for uh, real-time questions. So we used one tool for uh, pre-recorded uh, questions. During that whole week, uh, people could access the information and another tool for uh, real-time questions. Both of them were taken into account by session chairs. So we moved uh, to this uh, pre-recorded presentation and uh, question and answer heavy sessions. Another three, important three, thing minute, is, three minute warning. Okay. So another important uh, decision, virtual coffee breaks. How do we promote interaction? We thought that uh, we could organize uh, 12 mini panels and those mini panels were about the topics uh, of the, the conference. So we asked relevant people in the community to ask those mini panels and they were attended by a lot of people and they were very successful. Choice of tools. I will talk about that later. So uh, Huba uh, plus Zoom plus Wistia. About the, the budget. Uh, here, there is a summary of the, the budget. The important thing is that we already held a physical uh, PC meeting, so we have a lot of expense in that respect. And thanks to the uh, agreement uh, to move the conference uh, to uh, uh, the same place one year later, we averted all the penalties with all the venue cancellations. So there were no cancellations, simply we moved all the contracts one year later and this way we avoid, uh, avoided that extra uh, cost. With uh, this uh, budget from uh, travel grants that were not used for travel grants, but instead for uh, preparing the budget, we managed to uh, get the, the budget approved by IEEE. And then we got a large surplus because this was the income, $30,000 uh, income uh, out of registrations, despite having a very low registration fees. Why? Because we uh, more than double the uh, historical record of attendees uh, to this conference. We got uh, 1,700 attendees. We moved the, the conference for, uh, the physical conference for 2021 to Valencia. And as I said, we renegotiated all the contracts uh, without penalty and we ported all the industry sponsor funds to 2021. So we didn't spend a single cent, uh, dollar from uh, those uh, funds. And regarding uh, software tools, as I mentioned, Huba plus Zoom plus Wistia. Huba handled registration plus agenda plus access to papers, to recorded uh, presentation videos, and recording of live sessions. Those were made available after the, the sessions. And additionally, offline questions that were asked before the, the question and answer session. With Zoom webinar, we uh, presented the sessions live plus uh, real-time questions. We, uh, we use uh, two streams for the main track and two additional streams for workshops and tutorials. And finally, Wistia for uh, broadcast bandwidth because it's not banned in China, Iran, and other countries. YouTube is, is banned. 
So we decide to pay a little bit more and make sure that uh, the contents will be uh, broadcast everywhere in the world. And as you know, these kind of tools enable posting, replaying, etc. And finally, some grace for the, the people who uh, mostly contributed to the success of this uh, conference. Jose Martinez as uh, general co-chair, Lieben Haut as program chair and main organizer of the mini panels, Samira Khan and Jose Renau to uh, workshops and tutorials, Saugata, the, the web chair, and very important, Josué Fli and Lucia Pons uh, were the two people who uh, helped us with these uh, new tools to handle things like uh, arranging all the, the program, uh, putting all the files in the right place and things like that. So that's it. Thank there you. Are, Thank I'll you. So maybe, maybe we can uh, move some. I, I have lots of questions about the tools, but let's move those questions to the, the next session when we talk about tools and how well they worked. Thank yeah. you, Jose. So let's move to um, SIG MM uh, uh, for the MMSTS conference. Began is hello. Um, Hi, hello, Ali. All right. So actually, I don't have any slides. Uh, I'll just give a very brief introduction. Uh, MMSTS is a multimedia systems. It's not a, an extremely large conference. We usually get uh, between 100 and 200 people. This year, we got uh, over 200 registrations from 32 different countries. And uh, we, uh, we made the auto registrations. Uh, uh, okay, you ask my video. All right, here you go. Uh, we asked, uh, we asked authors to pay for uh, uh, half the usual price. Uh, so that was a good uh, news for them. And uh, pretty much everybody else paid almost uh, either, uh, you know, nothing or at most 50 euros, depending on their uh, ACM and SIGMA membership. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, so financially we were okay. We got a lot of uh, financial support, but they were all transferred to next year. In terms of uh, tools, well, we weren't really that much different, although, you know, we used Slido for real-time questioning, and as well as this was uh, for asynchronous questions. Uh, people could post questions uh, uh, anytime during the conference and authors will get back to those questions and answer them. For private chatting and uh, further discussions, we have a Slack space. And uh, for the main conference, we use Zoom as well as YouTube live streaming. YouTube live streaming was extremely uh, useful, although there is some delay, about like uh, 10, 10 to 15 seconds of latency. Still, uh, Zoom is unfortunately not allowed in certain corporate networks. So they cannot install Zoom or cannot attend uh, Zoom meetings uh, from uh, you know, work company for a uh, computer, for example, and those people just follow up the YouTube live streaming, uh, which I highly recommend you to do the same for such people. Uh, for our uh, program, uh, we asked uh, our speakers uh, to prepare a short talk, which is three minutes, and a regular talk, which is 15 minutes, and uh, give us their slides in advance. And we posted everything before the conference started, and people could have uh, looked at the paper, the slides, the short talk, the regular, you know, the long talk, whatever they would like to, and then start asking questions uh, actually in Slido before the conference started. This really uh, relaxed the, you know, timing requirement for us. So uh, that was, I mean, that worked pretty out well for us. Uh, we were a single track program um, and uh, we had only 30 minutes for each session. Uh, sessions uh, had four to six papers. So uh, it's, uh, you, you know, five to six uh, minutes per paper. And out of these five to six minutes, uh, uh, we gave two minutes for each speaker at the end of the session to just uh, briefly summarize what their paper is about and what their findings are in two minutes. And then the remaining time was just used for live Q&A. Everything was recorded uh, and uh, posted uh, on YouTube uh, on our channel at the end of the day. So. Uh, whoever missed our conference can just go back and do YouTube and uh, can listen to all the talks as well as the Q&A sessions. The keynotes were live. We had six uh, keynotes um, and the keynotes were live and, uh, but they were also recorded and, uh, you know, streamed over YouTube. Um, you know, I've seen some people asking about, you know, how to engage best with the audience and the participation. 
well, uh, you know, uh, is, uh, is someone who travels quite a bit uh, for meetings and then, uh, you know, uh, across different time zones. I know that when you are not physically in a meeting, uh, you end up doing something else, uh, even when you are attending virtually uh, for a conference. So, uh, you know, I suggested our steering committee to have our conference only three hours a day, which we did, and it worked just fine. Uh, it was a bit late for Japan, Korea. It was a bit early for San Francisco, but we survived. Yes, there were still maybe some people in the Pacific Islands or, you know, in Hawaii who might be vacationing at the time, but still, uh, you know, I think we survived. I believe engaged uh, audience for three hours is better than not engaged audience for like uh, six, seven hours. So as much as I appreciate the idea of follow the sun or, you know, mirror the program type of ideas, you know, we try to minimize the load on everybody. So, you know, and, but then we are not really a very big conference, 200 people. So maybe that doesn't work for other conferences. Uh, for the engagement, uh, we gave a couple of really interesting uh, awards, like best engagement award, for example, those who asked uh, the most meaningful logical questions in Slido. And these are just, uh, you know, free registrations for next year's conference. And also we had a best show, social media reporter award which uh, you know was given to someone who actually used Twitter, Facebook, or other type of tools uh, most effectively to you know advertise the keynotes or you know uh, speakers and so on. Uh, we had a couple of social events. Uh, the best one was MMC's trivia. Uh, this was uh, uh, you know organized by one of one of our uh, uh, student uh, volunteers on Kahoot platform. I mean, it's, it's, it's very simple, but it was extremely fun. It was probably the best moment of the entire conference. I mean, uh, there were about 45 people and it was really awesome. And even if we go uh, physical next week, if we can do that, we will we plan to have another trivia next year. Other uh, social events were mentoring speed dating. Uh, this was really just putting people randomly in different breakout rooms and let them uh, chat and talk to each other. And then the last one was anti-women, you know, networking uh, women meeting, uh, which was open to anybody, not just the conference attendees. So and uh, this was announced by IEEE, ACM, bunch of, uh, you know, uh, women-led organizations. So a lot of people came in for that session. So, um, uh, you know, uh, that's essentially what it is. Uh, I think, uh, you know, as much as uh, myself and, uh, you know, based on the survey we did after the conference, I've seen people, appreciated the fact that everything for the conference was available except the live keynotes obviously uh, before the conference and they could just go on and listen to any talk they wanted to uh, in their you know own time zone or whenever they feel uh, right right so uh, that was uh, well uh, received slido was also well received it was a bit uh, maybe confusing for first time users but uh, frankly i think uh, slido is an extremely efficient tool in terms of q a and uh, you know, uh, managing the Q&A during the sessions as well. Uh, so that's about it. If there are any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer them later. Thank you. Thank you, Ali. So we move to <clears throat> another uh, SIGA Multimedia Conference, IMX, uh, by Mario. Yes. And you see my screen of here, man? Uh, we can see your Gmail. My Gmail. <laughs> there you go. Now okay. oh, it's coming. Okay, probably the delay. No? Uh, it's sort of, oh, there you go. Yeah, it's good. Okay. Okay. So, first of all, I wanted to mention that uh, IMX is a, a conference sponsor, co sponsored by CKMM, but it's, it is really a CKA conference. And also, the first thing is that we apply to organize TVX. Uh, probably you. IMX is not, the name is not familiar for you. It stands for Interactive Media Experiences and it is because it was called in the previous year, years TVX. Okay, so we changed from TVX 2020 in Barcelona to IMX 2020 virtual. Basically, we have talked about registration types and fees. In our case, it ranges from free registration from students, volunteers and unemployees to, and the maximum fee for it was 250 euros for authors that were not SIGCHI members. Also, some key figures from the conference. In our case, we want to mention that we had five workshops collocated with the event, but the pandemic had an impact on the, on the workshops. For example, two of them were cancelled. 
and also in, on the keynote, one of them decided not, not to participate in a virtual event. And also in the in the slide tracks that whose, which deadline happened in, in February, March, it also uh, we had an impact on this because we received uh, lower uh, contributions than expected. Overall, the numbers in in overall terms, the numbers are very good, but for this side products in which the, the, we also the lockdown already affected to, to, to these contributions. Also, for MC, uh, IMX is a small conference. It receives around 120 or 150 participants. In, a, in our case, we received 191, nearly 200. So we were very happy with this. And we also got a positive balance in terms of budget. We can share more details about this. If you are interested, just feed me, but because we don't, don't have a lot of time. We uh, use the SIGCAI app for, host, for uh, giving the access to the program. And we also prepared a, a private page on the, on the website, giving access to the, all the programs, all the sessions with the videos recorded that were available on the SIGCAI uh, YouTube channel with subtitles following the SIGCAI recommendations and also giving access to the, the papers on the digital library and slides and so on. In terms of tools, we use Zoom and we use like a, a combination of many to many sessions with breakout rooms, for example, for the doctoral consortium and for the workshops. And we use webinar for the, the papers presentation and for the keynotes. The keynotes were not recorded, were live and all the, after the presentation of each recorded uh, paper presentation, we had also a live call questions and answer uh, session. In our case, uh, what we didn't like a lot of the Zoom webinar mode is that the attendees seem, uh, feel a bit isolated. For example, they are not aware of how many participants are active in the session. So what we did is we, we notified them in Slack uh, regularly, okay, there are 100 people connected and, and we were saying hello to the participants or to, to boost interaction for them, okay? We also use Slido as for MC, as, uh, as it has been mentioned before, and it worked pretty well. And we also use Mozilla Hubs as a social space, as it has been mentioned before, for presentation of posters and demos, and it worked pretty well. I will give more details later. Uh, well, this is this slide. Basically, uh, we prepared, Ayman is here, and he can give more details if you are interested. Basically, we prepared like a lobby in which all the people is connected and the, the lobby had portals to different domes where posters and, and demos were presented. And we also ran a, a study about how the people behave in, in these spaces. Uh, we don't have the results from the survey yet, yet because we wanted to wait for the meeting today in order to also ask about the key, key questions from the, your delegates of learn from, from the people participating here in, in, this, in this session. But our impression is that it worked pretty well and it was very welcome for the users. We also have some branded items for sponsors, for authors and, and for volunteers. Basically, this is a video in 90 seconds, but if you're interested, it's the, the, the highlights of the, of the conference. If you're interested, please go to, to the website. Some takeaways. Okay, so the, the conference at the end didn't happen in Barcelona, but both Barcelona and the host entity had a big presence. In our case, was we believe that it was a, an innovative format that it was well appreciated in general by attendees, the steam committee, by SCM and, and SIGCAI. We also have the impression that this hybrid format will can be a game changer, or, or they, they will work. They will work, and this is in our case for IMX 2021. This is it seems that this is the approach that they want to follow, and also one of the or messages that social VR. We're not saying that Mozilla Hubs is the, the platform, but social VR as a medium is a powerful communication medium for hosting interactive sessions and for also for social events, because it's a way that people can meet and be more informal. Yeah, they, they can chat like in a, in a physical uh, conference. So it worked quite well for us. And I, we, we believe this, uh, I, this is an interesting format. Uh, yeah. yeah platform for, for, for visual conferences. And uh, we want to, to conclude the talk by thanking uh, ICM, we have Sade here in the call, and thanking Sikai, we have Ayman and Andrew also here, because of, of the support, the, the, their guidance and the help. And of course, finishing thanking the, the sponsor and the 
supporters and thanking of course the organizing committee because if it is a huge effort to organize a, a physical conference it is also a huge effort to, to organize a virtual conference and in our case we we were very lucky to have a great team helping us so basically that concludes our presentation if you have any questions or you, if you want to post them on the chat we will be thank, happy to thank you them. mario yeah if you have questions <clears throat> please use the chat i think we you know since we're virtual we can take advantage of the fact that we have multiple channels going on at the same time even though the chat channel on zoom really sucks but let's let's try to make the best of it so <clears throat> we move to the next presentation uh, it's another multi multimedia conference uh, by and christian reese is going to uh, present that's uh, uh, i h n m m sec christian we are not hearing you we're seeing the screen share but not we cannot hear you. Hold on a second. There you go. Is it better now? Yeah? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Wonderful. So, um, <clears throat> so this is the ACM workshop on information hiding and multimedia security. Um, it was supposed to take place at Colorado Denver, but then it, that didn't happen, apparently. Let me give you a very quick overview. Uh, demographics, topic-wise, there's a majority of steganography, steganalysis people, and a minority of like federal security, multimedia forensics people. Also, region-wise, we do have a disbalance here. So the majority are probably Europeans, and the minority are uh, US researchers and Asian researchers, uh, just looking through participants from the past years and also this year. Um, it's a single track workshop, very small, 19 accepted papers, two invited talks, two social events, um, and 64 participants though. So we, we calculated with a minimum of 40. So that was, that was nice. 21 students, 43 senior researchers. Um, and we decided to extend it to four days. It originally, typically it's three days when like traveling to that location. We extended it to four days and made the individual days a little bit shorter. So the days were between four and five hours. Um, since this was supposed to be hosted at Colorado originally, um we, we decided to start it at the day at 10 a.m new york time uh, which was late afternoon early evening in europe and late night unfortunately in asia we didn't have a good strategy to, like in, in the sense of multiple tracks or so to to accommodate for that attendance fees were significantly lower than in previous years so we had like 60 to 80 dollars for students 90 to 120 dollars for senior researchers and sigma members like almost nothing okay so the technical setup um in in that ih mmsec community let me let me just say this to explain things there are also people working in privacy so they 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 are quite sensitive to the choice of platform. Uh, in that sense, uh, Zoom or so was, was not really an option. So we used a big blue button server that was hosted at a public institution, in that case, University of Magdeburg in Germany, um, <clears throat> as the conference system. Uh, on the other hand, we also had a couple of Slack aficionados in our organizing committee so that is why we also offered a Slack workspace for chatting. Um, interestingly enough, this eventually was only used by the organizers as a way of communicating like outside of the, the public sort of uh, communication that was possible within this Big Blue Button system. So Big Blue Button itself, it supports audio, video, and has some, some means of, of chatting. Maybe a little bit more convenient than in Zoom, but we can discuss this, of course. Um, it definitely has a weakness when it comes to concurrent video streams. So, uh, so to keep this at bay, uh, we we 
what we communicated beforehand together with other technical details was that we said, okay, like if there's a session, um, it's fine if the speaker and the session chair, they activate the video, or if people meet in breakout rooms, they can move freely in big blue button between breakout rooms, then they can also activate video. But other than that, please uh, resort to audio and chat, which was probably fine since it was a relatively small conference or so and people, like it's a small community also and people know each other quite well, um, the majority of people. So the way how we handled it is that we had a virtual like main room in Big Blue Button where there were this uh, presentation, single track presentations. Um, and we had permanently open breakout rooms and, and users can freely move between rooms, also be part of multiple rooms at the same time, but this can be very confusing with respect to audio. Um, <clears throat> it turned out, in fact, that um, only one breakout room always was used in breaks. The number of that breakout room changed. But apparently, like people saw, ah, oh, okay, there's someone in that breakout room. So everyone also went to that breakout room, and we didn't really manage to to distribute them in in any meaningful way. Um, yeah. So, organization-wise, so we said, uh, please, please send us video recordings of your presentation as backup pre-conference, uh, and if you like us to to play them also for your presentation, we can do this, but you can also give a live presentation, whatever you prefer. Um, interestingly, almost, almost all presenters then pre preferred us to play their pre-recorded video. Um, and um, during the talk, it was possible to ask questions in the chat. So that was quite active. That was the big blue button chat then because no one was using Slack. Um, <clears throat> And we had like a student of mine was collecting and organizing these questions in a so-called public notes section of Big Blue Button. So this was like a sheet where everyone could see and theoretically also edit um, the questions. So, so everyone could see the questions, which was quite good, I think. For the social program, um, uh, we did uh, games, so one was a quiz. I think this was fairly successful because we crowdsourced the questions from the participants. So it was something from their regional background or so. Um, and we had a, a scribble game, so it's like to draw words or so. This was probably less, less successful. Um, during games, however, we had of participants had audio activated in big blue button so this was this was fairly nice i'd say um let me give here like a slide with a lot of text again but like a little overview in green and red like what worked better from our perspective what worked not so nicely uh from our perspective so uh, let's go through the positive parts first. So, so we found these pre-recorded videos quite helpful. So we had no or virtually no technical glitches during the presentations and the presentation lengths. They were all within the time frame, certainly being pre-recorded. Also, um, authors engaged in the chat during the presentations already. So, so, so they had the hand freeze essentially to, to talk to the people, like write to the people. Um, <clears throat> also very helpful, the publicly visible questions uh, that were also discussed after the talk unless they were already resolved during, uh, during the talks um, in the chat and the shared notes. Um, and, and generally, the, 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 uh, we found this chat quite, uh, quite successful. We didn't expect this at all. But this may also be a reason because we had a small community people, a lot of people knowing each other already um, and not being such an anonymous event as these like much larger conferences. Um, <clears throat> so um, another benefit of the chat was that multiple concurrent discussions took place when particularly like interesting papers um, and certainly also the, the submitted 
videos. So we asked authors for permission um, to, um, to offer them to the conference participants up until one month after the conference. Um, and those who gave permission, those videos we, we made available on a separate server, password protected and so on, uh, since they were, again, like privacy, privacy aware people. Um, I think that was also a good thing. Um, overall, the participation was higher than expected. Uh, we attribute these to the lower fees. Um, so that was a success. Let me talk briefly about things that did not go so well. So um, although, we, uh, although we asked people to check their microphones and also did these things, uh, Q&A was not always smooth when, uh, uh, from the technical side. Um, and we, I think we kind of failed in our offer of some post-conference mingling or so that, that didn't really work out. For the social events, about 50% went back and checked their emails or did more important stuff. So, so, so we lost, let's say, 50% of the participants there. Um, yeah, what I already mentioned, we had a concentration to one breakout room for the social event. Um, how did work this engagement? So one or two people known in the community say something like, for the break, I go to room number two. And then everyone was, was like, ah, oh, yeah, okay, me too. Um, we were thinking afterwards, maybe labels would have helped. So like a uh, room one, steganography, room two, forensics, something like this. Uh, yeah, we can't, can't test this anymore. What was definitely too short and what I would change if I would organize this again, was that we scheduled 15 minutes breaks. Um, and and um, one thing might be because Having conversations in this, this virtual format means that only one person essentially can speak at a time. And so that's one assumption from me um, that this might be a problem. Um, and certainly also, I mean, at an actual conference, you can essentially continuously talk to people while you're getting up from your place, while you're getting coffee or something. But at a virtual river, uh, like virtual event, if you get a coffee or go to the restroom, then you're just away from the computer and, and that goes away from your 15 minutes breaks. Okay. Ms. Chen, you have, are you I'm, I'm at good. the end? I'm good. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> awesome. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Right on the spot. Uh, so uh, next we have um, Andrew Khan from uh, Sikai, talking about Kai. Actually, it's going to be David Iman Shama and Andrew Kuhn. Share my screen. Great. Uh, so uh, we went through uh, a lot of things here. Uh, we're kind of presenting a, across the whole SIG. Uh, IMX and Mario presented a little bit earlier. We're going to dive through some stuff, go over some stuff in the slides, and skip some stuff because it's already been kind of hashed over and over again with the slides. Um, great. So we all know the problems that we have here, uh, and a lot of it was we're um, kind of trying to build a boat while, while our boat is on fire. And so we're kind of dealing with that. And we have 24 conferences in the SIG, uh, and everyone kind of wants to do something different. Every chair kind of wanted some control, which is fine, but we had some conferences like Kai and DIS who just wanted their content online, where we had other conferences like UMAP and IMX, which you heard earlier, who wanted a mixture of these sort of live, uh, live engagements. And it's a, we, as a SIG, we have to really find the right logistics and then find the technology that scales that logistics. And then I'm gonna let Andrew jump in. Very good. So thanks Benjamin for pointing out that it's all about people. Um, you know, one thing that clearly came up is this question of canceling or rescheduling and it's very much tied to people. I, I think one key lesson that we learned is that communication with the community is key because the situation can change quickly. Let's really hope that we're not going to find ourselves again in the position that we were in in March. But if you recall in March, things would change literally day to day. It's not an exaggeration to say that one day you were thinking about delaying and by tomorrow it seemed like you're just a fool for even considering it. So it's really important to keep that in mind. And then also I think this, this came up organizers. Organizers signed up 
uh, to to run physical conferences, and now you're asking them to do a virtual conference. That's just that's just really not easy. And I think Benjamin made a really good point here. So we need to think about who's organizing what, and and uh, and really think about probably expanding the number of people who are organizing. So if we move move to the next slide, uh, thanks, Krista, for talking about some of these topics about schedules. And uh, this was really covered in in great detail. I, I, I think I, I totally agree, you know, probably need shorter things. The talks, I think one thing that would be worth re-emphasizing, we really need careful preparation and we really need thinking about how this is gonna be run. And there are some nice examples, for example, uh, there are some shorter CHI events that happened across the globe. And, and some of those I think are good examples of, of organizing things in advance and, and running good, uh, good events there. And then if we go to the next slide, I think uh, budgets are, are also important. And one key question here is cancellation fees. Uh, moving forward, we really uh, also need to take this into account. Thanks to our ACM colleagues, the negotiations are usually going really well. We couldn't do this. So I'm, I'm also, you know, Sekai is certainly very grateful for, for their efforts in reducing these cancellation fees. But we just need to be, as organizers, thoughtful about what do we sign up for, uh, what kind of travel plans, what kind of uh, uh, event plans because these are ultimately going to have to be covered by the community. Um, and then we asked this question, what does it cost to run an online conference? And you know, it's not free. It simply isn't the case that it's free. So I think it's also something that we as a, an ACM community need to think about what are, what are the expectations that we're setting up because, uh, you know, conferences don't run for free. Um, one aspect of this is overhead. So the SIGs have overhead. And should that overhead be covered? What does the overhead mean to the community? Uh, there are other SIG services that we all find important. And if we're going to keep having them, somehow that overhead needs to be accounted for. And then I, I find this really interesting. So it was nice to hear that a lot of conferences are basically having additional uh, participation and that's great. And I'm really curious how paying any sort of fee relates to attendance. My initial intuition anyway would be that paying makes us committed to go and not paying, having it a free event, probably makes it less likely that we will attend. So I think this is something to, uh, to consider as well. Um, and then finally, what should these fees be? And I think wh when I talk to conferences, I, I always point out that these fees should really represent the value that your conference brings. And, and this is a significant value. So I think this is important. At the same time, we have to be flexible. People are hurting. So we have to keep that in, in mind and, and not, you know, for, you know, we don't want people not to attend simply because they cannot pay, even though they would be great contributors. So we have to be, there has to be, in my opinion, some sort of a reasonable fee, but there also has to be uh, flexibility. Great. Now, for those of you in the call who may know me, you'll know that platforms is my bag as an industry research scientist. Uh, and so we knew that we had some infrastructure and chairs are very amiable to reusing that infrastructure, but we talked about a lot of these things before. Um, we have a very extensive video pipeline and SIG Chi where videos can be ingested. We get processed them with some bumpers and some treatments. We upload them to the DL and our verified YouTube channel. Uh, and we thought to have the authors upload the talk videos as well, recorded in their home or office. And this is really important because so not everyone in their home has enough Wi-Fi that can sustain a live stream. So if it's on somewhere else and can be streamed by somebody with a better connection or an organizer with a better connection, that's really critical. And we have something archivable at the end of the day, which we really like. And so one of the big things was the videos had to be created by the authors and had to be captioned by the authors because we cannot rely on automatic translations for archival content. Because if I say SIG Chi, it always goes to SIG Guy and we need that corrected. And so we actually made a lot of uh, guides for, for people to do this. Um, and then conferences can use whatever they like, Zoom or Twitch to stream that out. And then later on have live Q&A sessions after that stream video. Um, a lot of these commercial apps, we have, we have our own app that we've built in house uh, and SIG Chi. Uh, a lot of the commercial apps are hard to use or spammy or require logins and our usable privacy uh, people don't like that. Uh, and so we have this wonderful flow that goes from our conference management tool, PCS, to the ACM and the TAP system and then comes back and makes these lovely web programs. 
which we actually added DL links and live stream links and Q&A links to like Slido and so forth. So that you have this program that's the session organization of the conference that can fit a virtual or physical or hybrid structure. And all the links are right there to jump out and people can have discussions or Q&As and so forth. Uh, at, at IMX, I was a, a TPC there and I had to be up at 4 a.m. to run a session and I was very happy that Mario would stream the videos and I just had to take questions and, and that really helped out a lot because 4 a.m. I was not ready to do anything else. Um, we're, we're, accessibility is really important. We're gonna touch on that a bit more, um, but we're working with Wayne uh, at the ACM on getting that live captioning into Zoom because those discussion sections then don't have the captioning that we need. The talk and archival content does, but the Q&A discussion doesn't have that. We need that integration. And thanks to Sade and, and Wayne at the ACM for helping us move on that. Um, Experimentation is really important. We're gonna talk about that, I guess, in the next session. Uh, this is a, a visualization of the social VR workshop we ran at Kai inside of Mozilla Hubs. All these are really, really important, but there are barriers. We need to be aware of those barriers and, and we need to overcome them. Uh, accessibility is a large one. Hubs has some accessibility problems. Gather Town has even more. Um, and there's accessibility and usability are, are tied together, but we can separate them out as well because some of these systems are difficult to use just by themselves. And we need to think about the device and network requirements. If someone has an iPhone, can they join Mozilla Hubs? If someone has an old uh, Chromium book, can they get on Clouder or Gather Town? These things are all, you know, the empathy and testing needs to happen as we experiment and move forward. Um, but I would actually say accessibility needs to be at the forefront. And we've talked about this a lot, um, and we've, we're we actually blogging about it in our medium quite a bit. Um, but uh, we, there's the, the technical sessions that we can sort of stream in webinar formats, and there's the hallway discussions. We're actually thinking about what's in between that space, and can we make that richer? The idea of uh, the uh, AMA is a really great one that came up earlier, and we were thinking about that with workshops and symposiums and birds of feathers, and rethinking what those structures are. We're used to a certain set of them because we've built physical conferences so long, and we know what works and what doesn't work and what's required. And we need to think what happens in virtual spaces and what will happen soon and uh, hopefully soon in hybrid spaces so that we can promote those things, because those things add that value, because if it's just like I'm gonna pay money to watch a live stream of a talk, I can go watch it on the DL later, that's probably fine. The interactions and the, the kind of uh, sessions we run for those interactions need to change, and we need to have accessible and global reach and scale. So uh, yeah, that's what we've been pushing on at SIGCHI across all of our conferences, and we're looking forward to doing more. Thank you, Ayman, um, and Andrew. So let's move on to the last uh, conference experience, that's uh, SIGIR. Ben? Hello. Yeah. yeah. Um, hi, I'm here. Um, what, see, what you I'm, there you go. Excellent. Sorry, I'm on my phone here. So oh. um, sorry if I have any little tech difficulties. Uh, hi, so uh, I'm Ben Carteret. I'm the um, executive committee chair for SIGIR. Um, I think I'm going to reiterate some of the points that um, the SIGCHI team just made, um, which is, you know, I'm going to talk a lot about kind of our overall calendar of events and some of the thoughts that I had um, in helping the organizers plan the Cigar Conference. Um, so we have, we have seven sponsored and co-sponsored events. Um, that's kind of our event calendar. And um, obviously we've experienced quite a bit of impact in the schedule due to COVID, um, starting from Cheer, which was scheduled for, which was scheduled for March and had to be canceled. Uh, JCDL scheduled for June, um, postponed to August, and now it's gonna be fully virtual. And then the Cigar Conference, which is what I wanted to talk about today, is going to go fully virtual and it actually starts tonight. So we actually haven't done it yet. And um, we're gonna be talking about some of the decisions we made and then uh, I guess you know, we're gonna see how it goes over the next few days. Um, so what's the relationship between the executive committee and the conference? Well, the, the executive committee is the steering committee for the conference. We're usually pretty hands-off. We organize a few social events. Uh, we advise the general chairs. We support student travel and things like that. Uh, this year, the executive committee is much more involved in the organization of the conference, and um, I'm sure other SIGs are finding that as well. Um, SIGAR conference has been growing. It was 1,000 a th a attendees in Paris last year, and we were expecting 1,000 or more for, um, for this year. 
and then just a little bit about how we or how we normally organize cigar into um, parallel sessions and tutorials and workshops. So, um, so the uh, organizers and um, I, I see the comment from Vinay there. So uh, Iktir can be September or October. I put October there because because um, it's often in that uh, that time frame. But this year it is in September. Yes, thank you. Um, so in January 2017, we accepted a bid to run Cigar 2020 in Xi'an. Um, and in uh, January 2020 was the full paper submission deadline. So this was before, you know, this was when it was, the, the COVID situation was big in China, but it had not yet reached um, Europe or the US. And so the full paper submission came, um, about 50% of the submissions were from Chinese researchers. And so we felt it was important to keep the conference kind of in China um, for that reason, even as, as it did go virtual um, in April when that decision was made. Uh, so over the past couple of months, we've been doing a lot of planning, a lot of organizing, uh, a lot of trying to figure out um, how we're going to do this. Um, one thing I want to say, you know, it's again, I really agree that it's all about people, you know, people, people, people. So I have the organizers here, the PC chairs, co-chairs, uh, general co-chairs. Um, I think it's also about communities. You know, it's also about all the different communities that participate in the conference. And I kind of see my job as chair to make sure that the conference is accessible to those different communities. Um, so in the case of Cigar, that means a, you know, the, uh, the community in the Americas. It means the community in Europe, the community in Asia Pacific. It means the digital library community. It means the human centered uh, community. It means like the algorithmic machine learning community. There's all these different communities and they all come together at Cigar. Um, for different reasons, and it's important to me to make sure the conference is accessible to all of them. So, uh, so I, I don't want to talk a lot about the structure of the conference and the platforms um, the organizers decided to use, except that uh, the decision to keep the conference in China did have a lot of repercussions in terms of what platforms could be used and in terms of some of the pricing decisions. So Zoom, for example, has a, a different pricing structure in the Chinese market um, than it does in the US and Europe markets. Um, it's significantly more expensive in China. Um, we can't put videos on YouTube, or we can put videos on YouTube, but then they're not going to be accessible to the Chinese participants. Um, we cannot have Slack or Discord, Discord available to Chinese participants. So because of the, the firewall in China, you know, we have a lot of, um, that introduces a lot of issues, or it introduces problems in terms of what technologies we can use. Um, and also keep the conference accessible to everybody. Um, so yeah, so, so I see the comment that Slack is available in China. I've heard differently from the organizers who are in China, so I'm, I'm actually not sure that, you know, I'm not in China and I don't have access, I don't have uh, a lot of visibility into what's available there, but the organizers have said it's not available to them. Um, so, let's see. So a, a few of the things that we're trying for the conference. So um, it was important to us to try to have conference schedules, conference sessions scheduled over the 24 hours in the day. Uh, we have keynotes and paper sessions, which are distributed more around Beijing time, but they're stretched out more than they normally would be uh, at, a, at a physical conference. Uh, we're going to have recordings, which are available after sessions. Um, during the um, Eastern times in the afternoons, you know, 12 hours removed from China, so this is over the, the overnight in China, um, there will be discussion sessions where people can watch videos together and discuss the papers uh, with some of the authors who are available then. Uh, we've added more keynotes. We're going to have six keynotes rather than the two that we usually have at the conference. We're doubling up our social events. So we have two instances of a student event, uh, two instances of a women in IR event, two instances of our business meeting, um, and those are to have um, options that are available or options that are better for certain time zones. Uh, for registration fees, um, I, you know, this is, I think this is an important question also, and something that I, I it might be worth discussing, but um, I think we're asking for a lot of volunteer effort in putting these conferences online, and I think there's a good question about how much of that volunteer or how much of that effort should come from unpaid volunteers who are giving up their time to do that versus paid services. Uh, and we did choose to use some paid services for CIGAR to make things a little bit easier. 
And um, this is also part of the um, part of holding the conference in China kind of required us to use some more paid services. So, uh, so the conference ended up going with a per paper author registration fee of $350 and then non-author attendance fees of $115 for non-students and $45 for students. Uh, and then the other thing is that um, SIGIR often, uh, SIGIR offers a lot of travel support, especially to students. Um, this year we're offering more of that to cover more of the registration fees for attendees. And so here's, uh, here's the schedule. Um, those big blocks of free space, those are in the US Eastern time afternoon and those are where the discussion sessions are going to be. Um, the conferences, like I said, it's starting tonight with a summer school and then continuing with um, tutorials. And then the main conference, which is all the, the, um, the blocks in red here. Uh, and this is a 24 hour calendar. So this is showing 24 hours of the day. And then I just wanted to wrap up to briefly um, briefly show the registrations that we have. So as of this morning, we have 1,433 registrations. This is the most ever for cigar by about 40%. Um, and nearly 60% of registrations are from China and the Asia Pacific region defined more generally. Um, so um, yeah, so I guess that's that's what I have. So thank you. Thank you. I mean, thanks so much. We were able to catch up the delay that we started with. Uh, I don't know if there are a few questions that we should uh, um, both see. Good luck, by the way, for CIR today. Thank um, you. <laughs> so uh, th there's a, I, I think that I saw a recurrent theme um, that is related to this part. So let's, let's just focus a little bit on on that. So a question that I saw or a comment that I saw being talked uh, during this past hour was the, 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 the issue about time zones and how to organize the program, whether, you know, whether to have, you know, long stretches of five, six hours or to have smaller stretches of two, three hours and how to allocate that. So it, my only comment on that is it would be great to know what works and what doesn't work. I think we're, and then a big experiment right now, and um, we don't know. So I guess we all come to it with some expectations and some hopes that things will work or not work. Does anybody want to address maybe the, the conferences that made some decisions about about that and how the how it went for the participants? If you had, if you asked specific questions at the post conference survey about that. Yeah, first, uh, Jose Duato here from uh, ISCA. I can. Uh, mentioned that uh, in our case, uh, the outcome was very successful. And what we did is uh, to select three time slots so that uh, one of them uh, was uh, good for everybody and uh, the other two slots, one of them was bad for Europe and the other one was uh, bad for, uh, for Asia. But uh, this has to be linked with the, the way you organize the conference. This cannot be uh, simply uh, arranging the, the papers in those sessions. So we use the, the main schedule, the, the one that was good for everybody, for the keynotes and things like uh, uh, industry track session, um, award ceremony, uh, things like that. So the, the, the main part of the, the conference, that, that the one that is usually attended by everybody. And for the remaining sessions, since not everybody could attend, we took care of distributing access to papers full papers and pre-recorded videos to everybody one week in advance so that people could watch the information they were interested on at any point in time, not necessarily during the sessions. And they could post uh, questions at any point in time using Hoover, well in advance of the, the Q&A session. And in case they couldn't attend the Q&A session live, those sessions were recorded and uh, they were able to watch those uh, Q&A sessions later. So even if they were sleeping at the time, they could watch the, the session and they could have participated very much like if, if they attended the session. Does anybody have any other comments? Especially the conferences that decided to go with the longer stretches of, of programs. Did you feel that some people felt excluded or did it work okay? Did you get any survey results? 
Hi, uh, this is Sharon Hu. Can people hear me? Yes. Hi. Uh, so I'm, I'm representing uh, SIGDA. Um, we have some big conferences, small conferences all over the place. We have a few conferences uh, already had virtual and we just, actually this is the last day of our biggest conference, Design Automation Conference. Um, so I can speak a little bit about the, the way that Design Automation Conference, the way it's set up. It has a, both the, uh, the exhibition side, uh, exhibition part. So we use the virtual exhibition, and then we, uh, which is a, typically is a pretty big uh, event at DAC. And then we also have the technical side. And both are run in parallel. And uh, it is a full day event. So we start in the nine o'clock Pacific time because it's supposed to be taking place in San Francisco. And it went all the way to five, six, six o'clock in the evening. Then we, we even have some social hours at 6 p.m. Uh, and so forth. Um, I think from some of the feedbacks I heard, going back to the question you are asking, uh, this long day, it's, uh, especially for research uh, uh, events, uh, it's not necessarily the best because especially we have lots of presentations in the afternoon, um, afternoon, uh, uh, middle, uh, or should I say about noon time, like 11, 11 a.m. Pacific time and 2 a.m., uh, 2 p.m. Pacific time. And all of these are really bad times for people in Asia and in Europe. So there's, I have heard quite a few people saying, hey, now it is uh, virtual. Why not make spread out into two weeks and have shorter, shorter time? So I think that's, if we're going to do this again, hopefully we don't have to. Uh, that could be a, a, a way to go forward, spread it out a little more. Thank and, you. Uh, yeah, so that's what I want to share. Yeah. So uh, Ali has his hand raised. Ali, Megan. Uh, yes, so uh, I just, I mean, we already said a lot of things on the chat. I just want to add two things. So, I mean, we are all becoming a screen, uh, screen fatigue. It's just, I mean, that's uh, something unavoidable. And uh, I really advise every organizer to think about it. Uh, we cannot expect people to sit down in front of uh, the screen and uh, listen to people for hours and hours. That's not going to work. And second of all, when, again, when people are not traveling, they have other things to deal with. Yes, people are home taking care of, you know, kids, babies, or other stuff. And um, still, you know, trying to cramp everything in a, a shorter amount of time sounds a bit difficult, maybe not really desirable. But, uh, you know, for someone like me, it works the best. Uh, you know, I just get, get done with it and then move on to other things. So, uh, okay. yes, that's, uh, that, that depends on what the audience is, where the audience is, and, you know, how big is the conference. But I think uh, these questions should also be considered by the organizers. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. We have also a hand raised from Peter. Peter Brzezilowski. Uh, <clears throat> First of all, I'd like to comment uh, on the last thing. Uh, stretching conference out, it's a really challenging thing. I have attended by now already five different virtual conferences. Stretching it out, it, I, I would not support that. It. It's getting people bored. Uh, so it's rather get multiple trails and you can get what you get and, uh, and well, take it. Uh, the conference was six days. It was way too much, right? The second thing, we do have the questionnaires. If we're sending more, I'll share the results with everyone. Uh, so far, for user modeling, we get questionnaire asking people how many of them took the late replication sessions, which is for Australia, India, whatever, and how many took the basic one, which is United States, Europe. A very small number of people took the replications. And I was speaking personally with a bunch of people, and they basically, it's all recorded talks played back, right? It's not clear why, in fact, you need to have two different times when you play the talks. You can just listen to that yourself. At the same time, everyone complained that after playing that talk, there was only five minutes for questions. So I think this, the model which has been suggested before, uh, extends it uh, time to talk with the speaker. That's what is easier to replicate. And I don't know whether we need to replicate the talks. Again, the other feedback from the conference was the quality of recorded talk was much, much worse than the quality of live presentation. And they tend to be boring. The same person when he's re she recording, presented in a boring way, while in the live, they present them more exciting. I don't know what to do, it's psychology. So maybe we shouldn't repeal each of these ways. Uh, well, that's, that's 
Okay. Excellent. So you know what? For the sake of uh, keeping this not to um, to drag the the schedule for very long, I'm going to uh, stop the, this part of the meeting here. Thank you so much. I think this is super useful for for everybody to listen to the different experiences and different opinions. Everybody, you know, there's lots. We're all experimenting, and uh, it's important that we keep kind of communicating and gather all this information so that we <clears throat> can uh, iterate over over time to make these these conferences a little better. Uh, Chris, well, actually, I raised my, my hand to, to ask everyone who has the conference platform used, could you share your experience with the platform? That's a kind of what we need, because it's clear that just Zoom uh, and Slack is not enough. It's better to have something which, and I have posted the questions as nobody took the question. And some of the conferences use the platform, some don't. But what is really important for us is your experience. If you can get like a paragraph or two, what was good in the platform, what was bad, and share it with us. We can figure it out what to tell to other organizers. Thank you. Excellent. Okay. That and that is a great leeway to the next part of the meeting. I think who is the chair? Is it uh, Benjamin? It's it's me, I think. Yeah. Thank you, Krista. Um, okay, so this last section of the meeting is on tool support for virtual conferences. And of course, there are 1 million tools out there. And I hope that uh, in the chat, people will talk about ones that they know about. Um, but uh, we have three that are actually making presentations. And so without further ado, let's move straight to the presentation of Clouder by Jonathan Bell. Great. Thanks, Benjamin. Thanks again, uh, Jens, for organizing this meeting again, and uh, everyone who's been here and sharing their experiences so far. It's really helpful to hear uh, what's working and what's not. So Clouder is an open source virtual conference platform that uh, I have been working on with Krista and Benjamin, something that we started um, around April, May. Uh, upon realizing as pretty much the discussion is going now that there are a lot of individual components that work well for virtual conference organization, but it's really hard to get them together in a way that's cohesive. So we kind of set out to try to replicate all of the, the key features that you might have in a physical conference that make it engaging. So of course, we have the paper presentations, we have our technical program where we have this mostly one-way presentation. Um, maybe we have a pre-recorded video, maybe we have some live uh, event, but either way, a form for question and answer for sure. We might have lots of kind of smaller two-way video conversations or, or two-way text chats uh, centered around, say, posters, um, where we want to replicate this ability of saying, here are all the posters that are being presented at this time. You can kind of see everyone who's standing around there and can drift between and find posters that are interesting to you. We want to try to capture in some way uh, the kind of hallway conversations that you have, maybe between sessions. Um, we're not going to provide the coffee, we would provide the break. Um, and you know, ideally, if we can come up with some way to try to capture the, the feeling of being in a different place you know, walking around city streets with colleagues and, and forming friendships um, and, and really engaging a, a little bit more socially. So uh, we were partially motivated to get this started because we were tasked with organizing virtual ICSI, uh, which was a pretty significant 1500 person event in May. Um, and it seemed like the obvious recipe for our virtual conference would be this. Um, I think it's similar to what many use or a variant of this. We have Zoom for conducting uh, you know, live talks like this. Slack is a great chat platform. And then you, know, you can archive your videos on YouTube or live stream on YouTube or use a different service if you want to make it work in China. So our concern is you take those three systems and you put them together. You end up with three different systems. You're going to have three different sets, at least two different sets of logins probably. If you're the organizer, you're going to get at least 100 emails saying, what is the Zoom link or what is the Slack link? And it's, oh, it's always the same Zoom link. Oh my gosh, a little crazy. Um, but beyond that, you also have these disconnected participants because you don't have this notion of presence to say, like, who is it that's even at this conference? And who's watching the session with me? And, and how do I capture the notion of, like, 
oh yeah, I see like Peter is nodding his head, you know, right? Because I get that, but you can't really do that with a Zoom webinar with you know, a thousand people in your class. So our idea with Clouder is to bring together all of these different platforms under a single roof. And what really is the, the key part that we're leveraging here is the technical program. So why is the problem of hosting a virtual academic conference different from hosting a trade show? Like there are plenty of vendors out there who want to sell us software to run trade shows. And the difference is that we have this technical program and many of our conversations are centered around that technical program. Like let's go watch a paper, let's go walk a, watch a presentation about a paper and then talk about that paper and then meet other people who are interested in that paper too, right? Um, so Clouder brings this all together with a single login. Um, we handle emailing registrants directly, get them set up with a login, then they get everything. Uh, we have we do have progressive browser support actually based on the features that you want if you just would like to have say a chat platform and one-way video like watching but not participating uh, you could certainly make that work on say your old Chromebook um, and we have support for working in China we're not relying on slack which may or may not work we don't rely on YouTube and we use no Google product whatsoever um, so I think that's something that really drives home the importance. Sorry, you of said, you said you use no Google products. Don't use YouTube. Sorry, I missed that. Uh, you can use YouTube, uh, but it's not obligatory. And when we did this for ICSI um, to provide the best experience to everyone, we actually simulcast from Zoom both to YouTube and also to another service, IQII, in China. And then, based on a preference that the user selected uh, in their profile on Clouder, we would deliver them either the the within China experience or the general experience. Um, but everyone's cool. all the same thing. Yeah. Cool, thanks. That's just kind of an example of something that you get if you own the entire experience like this, that you can just drag and drop a different video stream in. Um, so yeah, we're really excited about centering a lot of the conversation based on the program and the context of the program. Uh, so I was last week the virtualization chair at ISTA. Uh, we didn't use Clouder because, you know, wanted to see how things would go if we tried doing this with Slack otherwise. Uh, many conferences have tried using or have used Slack uh, for managing Q&A. Uh, typical way to do it is that you post some, some uh, question, post some threads in Slack and say, you know, please post along this thread if you have a question on this paper. Um, how did this go at ISTA? Well, you know, people ask other questions. Someone asked what the Zoom link is. And then all of the questions show up totally in an unorganized way, and it's difficult to follow. Um, so that's not Clouder. But with Clouder, where we own your entire browser interface, which is to say, uh, you know, we're delivering everything that's sitting in your browser, we can put together your presentation, which is maybe pre-recorded, or maybe it's uh, embedded in Zoom, maybe it's YouTube, maybe it's Vimeo, some other service, doesn't really matter. Uh, we can give you a chat that tells you, uh, lets you converse with other participants who are in the same session. And we can just give you a single chat channel for every single paper. And if you're an author of a paper, we can automatically make you part of that chat channel, and then you'll get notified and all that fun stuff. So we use Clouder at ICSI. Um, this was the biggest test of Clouder so far. We had about 1,500 people logged onto the platform. Um, I'm just going to show a really brief overview of what it looks like if you're a participant at ICSI. Uh, ICSI is a multiple track conference. So at any given time, there were typically more that were happening where event was kind as like a big live uh, synchronous session. Um, we can see from this lobby view that there were three of these live rooms going on. Each one of them had some sessions going on. We can see that there's activity in these rooms like, oh, there are 61 people in Atlantic day one and you know, 86 in this other room. We can see the space that we're in right now. So we're not yet in one of those rooms. We're just waiting in the lobby. In the lobby, I can see everyone else who's recently come into the lobby, just like if I'm waiting outside of you know, the conference rooms and I see people walking by, I get to see who's coming through the space. I could expand there to see all the 276 people that are here, and I get some contextual chat, and I also can have direct messages with everyone that I want just by clicking on their names, seeing their profiles, and clicking send a direct message. We also have one click to go into a video chat embedded directly into Clouder also so that your participants can directly hook up using video um, and still stay in the platform. And part of the reason why we want to make sure that everyone stays in the platform is so that we can show you who is around you. So for instance, let's say that we're watching a keynote. Um, at this keynote, there were 170 people watching it. 
it would really stink if I was just watching this on YouTube or just watching it in a Zoom webinar and I couldn't see everyone that was there or even the fact that there were 170 people there. Uh, so here again, we get to see the 10 most recent participants to join this room. So as people walk in, you get to kind of see that and you can see everyone around you just by expanding that. Um, and then again, you can send direct messages, you can have that contextual chat and a message with anyone that you'd like. In addition to embedding these mostly one-way conversations in terms of video, where we'll drop in like Zoom or YouTube or IQII or Vimeo, we also have support for using a Twilio hosted video rooms, um, which is really special because this allows us to create basically as many concurrent video calls as we'd like um, without having to worry about the infrastructure and uh, it just works. So what we use this for is creating maybe these more hallway sessions, some ad hoc meetup tracks where some participants says, you know what, I'm interested in this topic of flaky tests. I'm just gonna announce in the chat channel, if you're interested in talking about flaky tests, come here. And then people do. Um, and then you get this little video room and you can see who's in that video room. And you can see all of the other little video rooms that there are just like maybe as you walk through a conference lobby and you see you know, couches off to the side and different people uh, sitting there. We can see on the left-hand side there, all the video chat rooms that are active right now and who's in each one. John, one, one minute warning. Please. Oh, one, sorry. One minute warning. Uh, yes, got it. Um, so we use these uh, breakout rooms. The fact that we can spin up as many of them as we want makes it really easy to use this to host uh, poster sessions. So in addition to having those uh, breakout rooms based on topics that participants self-organize on, we can also create one of these breakout rooms for each poster or each paper that you have, show the posters, click in, and then be in a video room with the poster authors. Um, I'll just finish by saying, uh, you know, Clatter is entirely open source. Um, we have a huge feature wish list. There's a lot that we've built in since ICSI. We have a few other conferences, smaller, this, uh, summer that we've already planned to support and if you're interested in uh, you know becoming involved using cloud or contributing uh, let's chat thanks great thank you um, we're gonna have again questions uh, at the end and in real time in the text chat uh, who is presenting for gather That'd be me. Great, Jason so uh, yeah we're uh, both in this, but we're not presenting for Gather, we're presenting what we did with Gather at EC. Great. Uh, cool. So I'm Jason Hartline, uh, and my uh, colleague and I, uh, John Kozowski, is here. Uh, we were on the organizing committee for uh, EC 2020, the Economics and Computation Conference. Um, and uh, together with Nicola Malika, who's the, the chair of, of SIGICOM, um, put together a conference experience almost entirely on gather.town, and it worked really well. So I want to tell you about uh, how, that, how that went. Um, so the, the main conclusion uh, that we got from this experience is that uh, virtual conferences on gather.town can be actually better in everything you care about than physical conferences. Um, and so I've listed the sort of the four main pros uh, that we experienced. Uh, and the, the first one I think is the surprising one is that there was actually more opportunity for interaction in the virtual space than there, there, there typically is in the physical conferences. Um, and then the other three are sort of the obvious ones you get from just being virtual, which is you can disseminate results more broadly, uh, it's more accessible to participants, uh, especially across geographic areas, and it's a fraction of the cost, those fi uh, you know, uh, financial cost and also the environmental impact cost. Um, the one con is that actually it was a tremendous amount of work to organize. Uh, the gather uh, dot town is a, they've got great uh, pipes, but they they don't organize the content well yet. And as, as someone mentioned earlier, uh, compared to trade shows, we have a lot of organized content that needs to be in a schedule, that needs to somehow get into the environment. And that's sort of like where the barrier is. Um, so uh, the main plus is that there's lots of uh, interaction possible and we're working on trying to make it easier to organize 
con conference content. And so you can email us if you are curious about doing this. Um, cool. So I think, so but prior to our conference, uh, many other conferences had used Gather for coffee breaks in between sessions that were mostly on other platforms. And the problem is, is that many people don't bother joining. And if many people don't bother joining, then you're not having that much interaction. Um, and so we worked very closely with the team at Gather to help them, uh, uh, to advise them on uh, features that Gather could have that would enable us to put the entire conference on Gather. And so feature two through five here are the main features they implemented for us that made it possible for us to just move everything to Gather and have everyone on Gather for the entire uh, four days of the main uh, technical program of the conference. Um, and I'll be demoing some of these in a second. So if you if you don't read it, that's fine. Um, we the honestly we were I think we got lucky in getting everything on Gather and uh, were shocked by how much people love the interaction and, and, and stuff they got on Gather. And this is just some of the comments we got from users. And you know, I think it's not just these comments, but it's also sort of revealed preference. After the fact, many people have contacted us about organizing stuff on Gather. Um, every workshop that was associated with our conference asked us to use Gather for their workshop after the fact, even though they were planning on doing little things in Zoom beforehand. Um, and people are talking to us about uh, running their courses on Gather in the fall. So there's something that these guys at Gather.town are doing is really effective. And, um, and getting people entirely on Gather for it actually makes it all, it makes it all work out. Um, so right now I'm gonna take you into Gather. Um, so you guys should all see me. I'm in the poster foyer, which is uh, the main thing where things happen. Um, uh, and I can walk around and see there's some posters here that I could go check out. Um, but I'm going to uh, look for Yanai, who's also here. Um, I put my mouse over his image. It pops up. He's uh, Yanai. He's at Microsoft Research. I can chat him or locate him. I'm going to locate him. Aha, uh -huh, he's uh, down here. Cool. And I've now found him. And he pops up on my screen. Hey, and I. Uh, <laughs> and uh, cool. So uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to demo. Uh, so you see uh, down in the bottom of the screen, there's some room, room C. We're right above. Um, we actually have a demo uh, set up. As you can see, there's a calendar on the left side. Uh, in room A, there's a, a demo for you guys. So I'm going to click that room A to see where that is. And we're going to walk there. Um, and uh, it, uh, it basically silences your mic when you're in a room where this is basically a watch party room. Um, and, uh, and I can press, at the bottom of the screen, you see it says press X to interact. Um, I can press X to interact, and it starts uh, playing this video. Um, let me resize my screen a little bit. Um, uh, and uh, is the there should be a countdown timer here, which I can't see because I've got a zoom bar in my way. Um, you need to press anyway, play, Jason. Jason, you didn't press. Oh, play. I have to press play. Got it. The their play. So, so you see, Jason now had to press play to start it because it's in a demo. What we had in the conference. Uh, this was actually queued uh, to start automatically. So as you can see, there's a timer that counts down in the conference. We had a 15 uh, minute timer. You see that this is a typical transition slide that we had. There are There is information about Q&A for the current papers, what you see on top. You can see what's next in each of the four uh, parallel tracks. Uh, this is parallel track D, so it's emphasized. The next talk is uh, is, is the talk that's in orange here. And currently, we're still at the Q&A phase between talks uh, or between uh, or before the first talk. And when the counter reaches uh, zero, the talk is going to 
uh, start. So currently Gather does not have a way for one person to share this thing. They don't have like a mic that goes up to the entire room. Jason will talk about that in a little bit. So uh, what we did, when it reaches 10, you'll see that this will be from the recording, not from me. Oh, you didn't share sound, Jason. Never mind. Yeah, I'm not sharing. There, the, the, there was a voiceover that said the, the, the talk is about to start. And then when it reaches uh, zero, you see the title slide and uh, the talk starts. And uh, what you'll see in the talk is that it's, it looks better than a talk recorded on Zoom in the sense that the speaker does not block the slides. And on the bottom right, you see a nice uh, conference logo, et cetera. We actually pre-recorded these talks on Zoom. And we have a bunch of scripts that uh, take the Zoom feeds and put them together nicely in this way so that nothing is above each other, puts it with a conference logo, combines it with uh, the transition slides and the timers. So the result is one large video for the entire session, timer talk, timer talk, timer talk, et cetera, that can be plugged into Gather or, or for that matter, in, into any other, uh, into any other uh, platform. I think you can, you can remove that from full screen, Jason. Are you guys about uh, less than a minute away from finished? Yeah, uh, cool. J Jason, go and so talk let about me, the posters. Let's, uh, yeah. let's go talk about posters. Yeah. Um, so we're going to uh, walk out now. Yeah. Um, these, these watch party rooms were all set up. Uh, right, uh, you know, all feeding into a poster session. So after the, after the watch parties, there was a, a poster session. And here uh, you see the, the posters are all set up. Um, and uh, if you get close, you can sort of see a, a, what the first slide the title looks like. Uh, and you can also hit next to interact. And you'll see the, the poster full screen. And you can look at the poster. If I want to then talk to the, the speaker, I'll walk onto the carpet. And then all of a sudden, uh, the speaker shows up. And I say, hey there, tell me about your poster. And I can full screen it. And we can talk about, uh, about the poster. Um, and this you know, feeding people out of parallel sessions immediately into a poster session where all of the talks in the parallel sessions have their own posters for you know, further feedback actually worked super well. Um, and there was uh, tons of interaction around that. Um, cool, so yes. that's, I think that wraps up. Yanni, do you have anything else you wanna say? So uh, another thing we did to increase interaction was at the end of each parallel session, we screened one minute videos for each of the talks in all of the parallel sessions so that you would have a glimpse of everything that would be going on in the poster session just in a minute, even if it was for a parallel session. There are a variety of other things on Gather, uh, conversation tables that we use for junior, senior lunches, a uh, variety of other things. Um, as Jason said, Gather is, has great pipes. We scripted a lot of things on top of that. The video is one example. The uh, posters here where you can see the first slide, et cetera, is, is, is another example, and there are more. And uh, yeah, uh, EC usually gets a few hundred people of attendance. We had 730 uh, distinct people uh, joining EC on Zoom, which is far more than we get for a physical conference. Guys, we should move on. Yeah. I'm, I'm done. Uh, Jason, do you want to say anything? Uh, we should uh, move on. Oh, okay. Sorry. Uh, okay. Last up is Adam Chapala, who's going to tell us about the Nectary system. Hello, everyone. Uh, it actually turned out that I had signed up for co-organizing at the time of this, this event, a, a workshop on tools that you can use for rapid assembly of software applications without any programming. So I'm, I'm just uh, stepping away from that to, to join this session. Uh, and that actually is the topic of what I want to tell you about. Nectary is a, a tool for sort of a mashup style application authoring, which can be used for many distinct purposes within the, the setting of virtual conferences. And I'll just show you a few examples uh, based around SIGPLAN ICFP, the, the conference I'm the, the program chair for. And um, you can also imagine connecting to really any of the other tools that we've heard about, filling some niches that they don't quite handle directly. So I'll, I'll screen share and show you what I mean. All right, so 
I'll start out by showing you this sort of fake front page of an, an ICFP virtual conference system. This is doing user authentication through Slack. So that can be the, the one place people need to create accounts and be aware of new passwords and so forth. And so then this is the page that a, a normal conference attendee would see listing the, the sessions that are, that are coming up, going on now and, and in the near future. Each one of these has a, a link to a button where you would watch a YouTube stream. This is starting to show one of the, uh, the distinctive design principles of Nectree versus some of the other tools we've heard about. It's trying to connect to existing services where possible. So instead of having a special video player in here, we would just link to standard YouTube stuff. Additionally, when I click over here to see which papers are going to be presented today, uh, you can see each of them has a little link to a Slack channel and a, a Zoom channel, a Zoom meeting that'll be used for, for live Q&A. And each of those is automatically created through an API. But we don't try to re-implement the uh, text chat experience in this app. We don't try to re-implement the, the video chat experience. Those are all being outsourced to these existing services, but we use an API to do the, the grunt work that you might otherwise push off on student volunteers to create all of these, these entities and external services that relate to your data, in this case, to your technical program. I can also drill down on one of these following a, a detail link that takes me to a page with the abstract, a little speech bubble for a, a Slack channel link again. And then there's a Slido style interface to ask questions here and everyone can vote them up and down. And there's a separate moderator interface to hide questions as inappropriate or click a button that sends them to Slack at the moment when the, the, the speaker is, is answering them, say because the person viewing this interface is in a Zoom webinar and just selected that question to speak, uh, pose to the, the speaker at that moment. There's also a, a unified calendar interface where for instance here we can see keynote, social event, different papers and so on. Uh, and we have a hallway track, which is basically just a place where you ask to create a new Zoom meeting and then the system advertises it to everyone, gives everyone the link to join, shows who's in there at the moment. And as each of these meetings ends, according to Zoom, it'll be deleted from this list. Uh, one of the other distinctive features I wanna show off what you can do when you don't have the one conference virtual conference system that's been built, but rather you have a, a, a tool for rapid iteration designing your custom virtual conference system, you can do things like this. We decided for this conference, we would have the New York centered time band and the Asia centered time band. And this application actually knows about that distinction and creates a separate Zoom Q&A room for the Asia friendly uh, times. And it, uh, Nonetheless, does that in a way that, that ties all of the, the video chats related to one paper together in the database and we can take advantage of that in the user experience. And for instance, it's the same Slack room shared between the New York and Asia views of, of this paper. And uh, actually the same record of Q&A. It's all connected together in the database without manual work creating those links. But another part of this, which we haven't seen in the, the other demos, is help on the, the organizer's side of this picture. First, let me show you what authors see when, when they log into this system for the first time. We're asking for their help doing planning across time zones, which is a lot more complicated than what we're used to in in-person conferences. Each author, when they log in, uh, the database is seeded with an export from the, the reviewing system, hot CRP in this case. We know all the papers submitted by any particular author and we can ask them, which of the Q&A sessions and which time bands do you plan to join? And when you've finished your pre-recorded talk video, please just upload it here. So this is replacing your Google Forms and, and Dropboxes and other more ad hoc methods that really rely on human labor. Also, we show a calendar to each of the, the authors and get their input on when they're available to participate in these different ways and they can click little smiley buttons to indicate how into these different times that they are. So then we can go over to the, the organizer view and we get our master list of all the papers. I'm actually using this to assign a, a moderator to each of the papers who will be the one who on a separate page gets a link to say, you're moderating a session at this time, click here to join the, the Zoom meeting and click here to see the list of questions that have been asked. There's also an interface for scheduling the talks, which uses the availability information that different 
authors have entered. And these little smiley faces with numbers are basically saying, for the time you picked, how happy were the authors with that time? And most of these are, are uh, fake data, so that they don't have the full author preferences incorporated. But you can use this to take into account time zones and other preferences and schedule all of your different sessions. And We're about let's... one minute left, Adam. OK, thanks. There's probably not too much more I want to highlight here. I'll just show the moderator page quickly. It says, well, here's where we ask the moderators which, which uh, discussions they're interested in moderating. They get the same time preference UI. And then there's a handy link here. OK, here's what you're moderating. Here's the link you click to join the, the text and video versions of it. So the basic message here, this is not one conference management system. It's a, an environment where with actually no programming, you can quickly experiment with different variations under the theory. Every conference is going to be a little different, even from year to year, but especially across different conferences and different SIGs. And you don't want to pay the complexity cost of everyone's features in one system. The ideal setup is to be able to quickly create your perfect conference management system, even connected to others that are handling some of the aspects we saw in the other parts of this, this session, and do that in a, a pretty seamless way. And that's what I got. Thank you, Adam. Um, we have, we're very close to the end, but we have time for a few questions. Um, Krista, do you want to go? Yes, I uh, think so. I, I just want to um, make sure that uh, you know, I feel a bit awkward, awkward about, about this situation because, you know, I've been working on virtual conferences for a long time and we put together the task force and we want people to have good experiences. At the same time, I was tasked with organizing virtual ICSI in, uh, you know, a, a period of two months. And so I, I went ahead and, and we started uh, developing this tool that was on purpose for develop, you know, for for providing uh, virtual XE support. That's the tool that uh, John presented, Clouder. So I just want to make sure that you know, for for uh, the total disclosure, it uh, I'm I'm going to tell you that so uh, Clouder is uh, open source. We are not a company. Uh, some, some other co uh, conferences want want to use it, and we will. Uh, support them to the extent that we have time for for that uh, but uh, it's all open source people can host it themselves so I just wanted to 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 disclose that and uh, it'd be great if we could also uh, hear to some disclosures from the other two tools so uh, I know uh, I know a little bit about Adam's tool I don't know much about Clouder though could you just both of you just say if you have any any what's your relation to the tool and uh, I mean, gather. Rather, rather, right. I, I can go first. That's a good point. I, I didn't mention that most of this is, is open source, but there's a layer on top that does the build an app without programming part, which is proprietary and associated with a startup company. Thank you. And, and for Gather, the, the organizers of EC, did you know? Are you related to Gather? No, we're not. Uh, related to Gather, um, but we're we're currently looking at whether it makes sense to take what we did and make it much more broadly available uh, via some kind of commercialization or something. Um, but because uh, because they actually they're they're serving all kinds of applications, not just conferences, and they're not set up to do the kinds of things that we need for conferences with organization. Actually, that the the last presentation was. Uh, uh, you know, really what's missing basically from Gather is like some way to organize all of the content and schedule it. Right. Okay. Um, let's see. Actually, I think we're just about at the end. Yeah, we, um, yeah, we, we, should, we should switch to Jens. So, so many questions. I, I think it's clear that uh, we, we need more discussion on this. But let me say, uh, first of all, thanks to all the presenters. Uh, thanks to uh, Benjamin, Krista, and Jenna for uh, uh, doing so much for so long and, and also today. And uh, thanks to Donna for uh, organizing the, the whole meeting. Thanks to JC for doing all the Zoom. And um, thanks for everyone for asking questions and engaging. Uh, I, I personally think that uh, virtual conferences will be with us for a long time and that there will be many of them in particular in 2021. So we should, we should continue the conversation and um, uh, we, we certainly have John Feigenbaum leading the new uh, standing committee on virtual conferences and we, have, uh, and we have all the six in conversation. Now we've started the conversation over the last two weeks and we will continue. 
and would be many people making decentralized decisions about what to do. And we should help each other both to make good decisions and to make the virtual conferences really good for everybody. So thank you, everyone. It's 12 o'clock here in California. It's lunchtime. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll talk again. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.